last Wednesday to discuss the contested Dornan Sanchez election results from California's 46th congressional district. Current Democrat Loretta Sanchez won the seat in 1996 by 984 votes. She replaced Republican Bob Dornan, who then asked the committee to investigate the results. Vernon Ellers of Michigan chairs the task force. I'd like to call the meeting to order, and I'd like to welcome everyone to what I hope will be the final meeting of the task force for the contested election in the 46th Congressional District of California. We will be, uh, the, the agenda is very simple, consideration of matters relating to contested election in the 46th Di Congressional District of California. The uh, order of business will be first a presentation by Mr. Kelleher from the majority staff and followed by uh, some brief comments by the committee counsel, Mr. Schweitzer. And I will then uh, proceed to make a few statements and a recommendation to the task force. We will then consider a resolution disposing of the business before the task force. So that will be the, uh, the order of business. There will be opportunity for comment from uh, all members of the task force after we have the introduction, the presentation, and the introductory comments and the pre presentation of the resolution. We will proceed immediately, and oh, I should notify uh, the witnesses and members of the committee. Apparently, I have a note here that the timing on the timer has changed. The amber light now runs for 60 seconds rather than the previous 30 seconds, which means that the timer will uh, Although this will not apply to Mr. Kelleher's presentation, but we will try to honor it for everyone else. Uh, it'll be uh, four minutes green, one minute amber, and then the red. The other fly and potential fly in the ointment is that we may have a floor vote at any moment. And uh, so we will, of course, have to recess the committee until we can dispose of that. After those introductory comments, I recognize Mr. Kelleher, who has been coordinating the analysis on the part of the staff on the issues before the task force. Since the last meeting, there's been considerable analysis by the staff of the uh, reputed illegal votes. And we have tried very, very carefully to examine all those that were regarded as suspicious or that indicated they might be illegal. And uh, the staff has done a tremendous job, and I want to thank them all. Both in the majority staff and minority staff have worked very hard on the analysis in this case because of the complex issues before us. We recognize Mr. Kelleher for an explanation of the analysis. Mr. Mr. Uh, no, uh, it is not in written form. He was going to present, present it orally, and uh, he has some documents which he has prepared which will be available to you after the presentation. Shorten it apparently because there's going to be a vote, so it's going to be condensed even as I'm presenting. Could you uh, pull the microphone a little closer yes, to sir. you? Yes, um, sir. <clears throat> I'm going to have essentially two parts to my presentation. Uh, first, I'm going to recap some of the major events uh, of the past year as far as hearings and meetings and subpoenas, etc. I'm going to condense that considerably in the interest of, of time. Uh, as we all know, this has been going on since December of 1997. We've had uh, three committee meetings. We had a field hearing in California. We've had task force meetings. Just a quick correction. December 1996. 1996, excuse me. Time, time flies. Time flies. <clears throat> Which got us into the process of analyzing and attempting to analyze just how many votes may have been cast Ill illegitimately in the election in California 46. The real bulk of the analysis that the committee has uh, conducted is based on the subpoena to the INS, which was done on May 14th of 1997. And then they delivered their first computer analysis to us on May 21st. It was a list of individuals whose last name and birth date matched individuals who are registered to vote in Orange County with the last name and birth date of persons who are in the INS's databases. This is a match of over 50 million people altogether. 
This information was provided on May 24th, excuse me. The initial match criteria for all persons identified by this investigation is a last excuse name. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I, I just, you went quickly. The subpoena was May 14th, and when was the response? May 24th, uh, May 24th, 10 days later. 10 days later, thank you. This is just the initial last name, date of birth match for all of Orange County, which constituted 500,000 names. And this was from the central index system and the naturalization automated casework system, which are sort of the two main databases at the INS. 136,000 of those last name date of birth matches were registered to vote in the 46th district of California. We then asked the INS to go to a first name exact match in the computer, which resulted in 4,329 names. The committee staff also manually took the 136,000 last name date of birth matches which ran to over 2,000 pages, and sat down and went through each of those, one by one, looking f to capture first names which were typographical errors or common vari variations, John and Johnny, uh, a misspelling, in order to find matches that would be missed by a computer, which is finding only exact matches. So we had another 1,502 matches through that arduous process. In addition to the CIS and NACS databases, the committee requested last name date of birth matches from some auxiliary databases at the INS. The Deportable Alien Control System, the Refugee Asylum Patrol Parolee System, uh, Deportable Aliens, self-explanatory, is relates to people who are, could be deported. Uh, refugees, asylees, and parolees are here in different INS statuses. Uh, parolee means they've had some sort of waiver of a to be here, and refugees and asylees depends on what country you may come from for different reasons other than just a normal immigration. There's also a student in school system which encompasses uh, student visas. Again, we manually uh, reviewed all of these to try to catch near matches as well as the exact computer matches. Uh, we had 83 from the RAPS and DACs and 192 from the student visa system. Beyond these INS databases, the committee cross-checked uh, additional independent databases, such as the Naturalization Services Corporation, which provided citizenship classes in Orange County through Catholic Charities, One Stop Immigration Center, and Hermandad Mexicana Nacional. This list actually included alien numbers, so we went first to the INS with the list of 19,000 alien numbers to see what they had for those, and then to the voting rolls. This located an additional 542 people. Uh, also the committee, uh, we also obtained lists of persons who the Orange County Superior Courts had recorded as claiming non-citizenship when they were summoned for jury duty. The contestants' attorneys had provided a list that had a name and city match. Uh, for instance, John Kelleher in Washington, D.C. There's just the name and the city. They had no birth date information. It's uh, not necessarily a very good match. So we got the birth, ma matched up the birth date information for that same jury list. And so we were able to go back to our initial match of a last name, date of birth match with somebody who claimed in the jury rolls that they were not a citizen. Then we then vetted that through the INS's records to see if the INS could either confirm or explain that a subsequent to being called for jury duty, they in fact naturalized, which turned out to be a case for a significant number of people. But there were 386 persons who did appear to have claimed they weren't citizens when summoned for jury duty. That was forwarded to the INS as well. The committee also reviewed the lists of persons who were clients or on the mailing lists of Hermandad Mexicana Nacional, finding an additional 419 people who names matched that of a voter and had those vetted through the INS. In addition to this, the committee requested at, this, at the suggestion of the minority actually in a letter to the, uh, the chairman of the committee that the INS produce a mirror image of the initial computer match runs by the committee. That is, the INS ran a match between the Orange County voter registration lists and the CIS and NACs seeking persons who had evidence that they were citizens on the date that they were registered as opposed to the original match in May, which was 
for persons at the date of registration not having any evidence of citizenship. This generated two matches, a last name, date of birth match, and a, first, and a full name match, as we've done for all the previous matches with the INS. There was over 100,000 people on the last name match and over, over 15,000 on the full name, excuse me. Again, we did just as we did when looking for evidence that somebody wasn't a citizen, when we're looking for evidence that they were a citizen on the day they registered, we did a full manual check, including through the 100,000 last name date of birth matches, looking again for our first name, our close first names. So we used the exact same methodology going both ways, um, which is only proper. Uh, with some of these, we then decided that we had somebody where we had conflicting information. Um, in the INS, in theory, everyone has a unique alien number, and also each of the voters has a unique affidavit number, and we've been tracking each of the voters throughout our whole system by using the unique affidavit number assigned to them by the Orange County Registrar of Voters, because it really is the legitimacy of the vote that's at issue. However, the INS, we found out, has in some instances more than one alien number for people in their system which in some ways explains why we're getting this mirror image conflicting information from the two matches. The INS was having the same person assign two alien numbers. And there's some explanations for that, that people move around the country, they get a new alien number assigned to them when they move from, say, Texas to California. It's not properly cross-indexed. They're being carried in two places within the INS system. In one file, they have no evidence of naturalization. In the other file, they do. And it took a while for the INS at times and for us to track down the second file and determine that the person had in fact naturalized. Although the previous file was, we're getting back an indication in May, not a citizen. They hadn't located both files. And so this mirror image match, which was the minority suggestion, turned out to have a significant impact on the finding of the facts because it turned out that the INS, you need to sort of go at it both ways in order to capture everything. Okay, so <clears throat> moving from the computer matches, we met with the INS and we established a system where they would take each alien number that we identified through these matches and go to the paper file of that person. They would pull their paper file, and they would summarize it on a worksheet. It would have evidence, any information about naturalization. It would have address information, middle initial, some basic identifiers that you could use to attempt to draw some comparison to the information that's in the registration affidavit, which also has address, name, middle initial, birth date, birthplace. So that's when we started processing well over 50,000 sheets of paper, which everyone can see stacked before you. We started getting in from the INS not until June 24th, actually, our first batch of paper files, about 4,000. And we're now over 7,000 of these paper files because we've had to correct, to request the, the conflicting ones. They may relate, multiple alien sh summaries may relate to the same person, which we had to sort out based on criteria such as whether their address is matched exactly. Two people with the same name, born on the same day, one lives in New York, one lives in Santa Ana. The one in New York, more than likely, is a, just happens to have the same name. So we created a file for each person that had been in this original computer match. Then we filed into it their alien summary. There was about a 50% error rate between the indication in the INS's computers and the indication in the INS's paper files. Essentially, a person naturalizes, their naturalization record is filed, doesn't get updated in the computer. So we do our initial match, we have these much larger numbers. When we get the paper files coming in, the person has in fact naturalized. Um, so as we winnowed our numbers down, we also winnowed out people, for instance, conflicting middle names, not the same person. We had started out with a last name, then we went to a first name, then we went to a middle name. Then we started adding other criteria, address, uh, birthplace, and at each one of these junctures, we knocked down 
the matches. It's, it simply turns out it's not the same person. We're also knocking out people as these conflicting files are coming in based on the mirror image request. On some of the ones where we had real tough matches, sometimes from the computer stuff it was obvious it was the same person and they were in fact naturalized. On some of the closer calls we got the additional data, had a better address match with the file indicating citizenship than then with the file indicating that they were not citizens and vice versa. Finally, we still had these gray areas, pots of um, persons who we could not really make a documented, clear, convincing case one way or the other. Doesn't really matter which way, just needed to, uh, to confirm one or the other. So we went a further level and we requested signatures. We had some people from this committee go out to Orange County, photocopy or actually off of these optical scanners, produce an actual original copy of all of the affidavit, affidavits of registration for persons who had, had been identified through this process. We also requested that the INS return to the hard files of everyone, make a photocopy of a signature in there, and forward those to us. We then, of course, had to refile, find everyone, match up their, their data, and try to go the, that, that next step. And this has actually turned out to be very helpful in that it cleared up a significant number of the gray area ones because the, it, we had people who didn't have real good address matches and the signature just sort of confirmed that they weren't really the same, the same person. Um, so the signatures is actually ongoing. The, the INS has not produced all of the signature data yet. Uh, as late as Friday afternoon, we were still getting signature information. Um, so that's ongoing, but obviously the numbers had shrunk to a sufficient point. As to who voted in the election is sort of a, a side beyond identifying people, because we've done all of these matches to this point based on just re the registration list, not actually who cast ballots in, that, in the November 1996 election. Because it is important beyond this election to know about the quality of the registration rolls in Orange County. We have from the Orange County Registrar a computerized list of persons who's voted, but that is not as accurate as it should be. So the Orange County Registrar's office also conducted a manual canvas of the election back at the time of the recount. They did this and they provided that information to us, which is a precinct by precinct breakdown of persons who should either be added to or subtracted from the rolls. We again took that and manually compared it to the computerized record of the, of the vote cast in order to get maximum uh, accuracy. We wouldn't want to be counting somebody who didn't vote or in, in the obverse, missing somebody who had in fact voted. We also had the California Secretary of State confirm the who cast ballots so that we just as a double check that we wasn't we weren't missing, misusing the manual canvas or misunderstanding the material provided by the Registrar of Voters. That again involved a significant num amount of manual checking because of, we have it anywhere in this whole process relied on computers to just spit out somebody's name. Uh, that's fine as a preliminary uh, indication of where we should go, but we have at, at all times checked that manually to the actual paper data that's been provided by these sources. And uh, that's taken me to the conclusion of our process from the original 500,000 last name, date of birth matches in Orange County as a whole down to a number below the <clears throat> margin of votes here and all in our number that we've gone through is to document to document by convincing evidence each one of these uh, and to document it from the INS and to try to get some sort of independent corroboration as well, whether it's a jury list or other sources of information. Uh, we've been, I believe, obsessive about the detail and accuracy of this and I'd just like to thank all the staff on both sides who have been, who have invested an immense amount of time in, uh, in checking this material and we'll continue to check it with the minority staff as we uh, write our final report of this. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Just a few points for clarification. Uh,
all the boxes here are filled with these files you referred to? They're filled with the files, and they're filled with uh, other documents that we've had to uh, subpoena or <clears throat> acquire throughout the course of the investigation. But the vast majority of this is the actual files, and each file has multiple sheets of paper in there. Their, their alien file summary, uh, the page from the voted record, which demonstrates that they actually voted, their voter affidavit, uh, a sheet with their signature on it, um, a sheet with their birth date, uh, with their birthplace information, excuse me, because we actually had to make a separate re request for all the birthplace information from the INS because we hadn't uh, thought to include that originally and we needed some more. Uh, so each file has at least a half a dozen different documents in it and where they appear in the Orange County voter, uh, the, when the jury list, uh, the, every sheet, everything is documented back to the original piece of paper that was provided to me by someone else. And let me just mention for the curious in the audience, who, uh, particularly the news media, uh, the lids are on the boxes because this is confidential information under federal law. Uh, these, these are data files from the INS and so forth. And so uh, the staff and members are allowed to look in the boxes, but no one else. Just as a matter of courtesy, I wanted to announce that. Uh, the other question is that chart you have over on the left is, is yours. Does, uh, you don't have to go through and explain it, but could you just comment on the purpose it, it, of it? It's an attempt to sort of graphically uh, capture all of the different stages that we've gone through with each one of these people. Each time that we received a, a, a name anywhere in this process, it started out as a, an electronic match, a last name, date of birth match uh, with an INS record. And then it eventually became a first name match and then a middle initial a match. And it eventually became a hard piece of paper with address and birthplace on it. And at each stage, it moved down through additional attempts to solidify the match and to properly document the status of that person. It also had different pieces of paper added into it as we went along. Maybe there was a conflicting uh, alien number on this person that we had to, that had to track down. And so now they would have two alien file summary sheets in there. And that is uh, sort of the, s the steps that it went through when it came here to the committee. Uh, summarized to the best sure. as possible. It's a and, well, and one final question. Do you have eight and a half by 11 copies of that that you uh, could distribute up here? I, I certainly can. I, we would appreciate that. I'm sure everyone would like to see that. Uh, Mr. Schweitzer, uh, your comments on this? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am, uh, I've been in this role as counsel to the committee for almost 20 years, and I am extraordinarily pleased personally by the uh, fair and impartial invest <coughs> investigation that was done in this instance. I know it was somewhat controversial when we embarked on the task of going into the discovery phase under the federal contested election statute, which I think was an appropriate uh, entry for us. And I think uh, th this investigation and the, and the ultimate result and the way it was conducted shows that the discovery phase can be made to work uh, during the process, we had a, a federal district court render a decision which upheld uh, a portion of the subpoena process. Uh, the, the, the statute isn't perfect, and, and there probably should be some uh, changes uh, made in the future. But I think uh, today is, a, is, a, is an example of how we can conduct this, uh, such an investigation uh, when a contestant files a notice of contest and do it in a way that that, uh, uh, that this House needs to do, in my opinion, because it is important that the House understand who uh, and, and, and render a decision as the Constitution requires as to who sits uh, in this House. And any contestant has a right uh, to file that notice. And also, uh, I think this uh, task force has performed admirably in conducting this investigation, as Mr. Kelleher has, has shown and put us in a position where we have uh, made precedent here now and, and can in the future uh, uh, conduct such uh, investigations and do that in a way that is fair and impartial. And I think that's uh, what, we, what we set out to do. If you remember at the outset, Mr. Chairman, when we had our first task force meeting, we, we stated that we were going to do this and, and reach a, an appropriate conclusion and do it right. And I commend all of you because I think you have done that 
And uh, I think this sets a precedent for what we can do in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, just to, uh, to wrap up the presentation. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Would it be appropriate to have Mr. Ballantyne, the Minority Council, comment at this time? If he wishes to comment, this Thank would you. be an appropriate time. We'll recognize Mr. Ballantyne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have two, just two points to make. Uh, I first want to say that uh, this was the first time we've had the benefit of hearing Mr. Kelleher's analysis, so I'm not in a position, having just heard it, to provide any detailed uh, comments on, on what he's done. But uh, to, to, I'd like to make two comments. Uh, at this time, one is I, I will say that our internal analysis, which uh, was no less painstaking than the analysis that the majority uh, has undertaken, um, uh, would would lead us to conclude that that the number of votes that are legitimately in question is is uh, certainly smaller than the one that the majority has come up with. But the second point I'd like to make, which is I think more important, is I think there's a, a fundamental misconception <coughs> about what this number signifies, and, and that the fact that this is uh, being uh, misconceived, I think, is, is demonstrated by a document which I picked up outside the committee room, which, referring to the 700 uh, legal votes, indicates and characterizes that as uh, representing that two-thirds of Ms. Sanchez's victory margin was fraud. That is a fundamentally unsupportable and improper statement for the following reason. There, are, even if we assume for a moment that there were, in fact, 700 illegal votes, we do not know, and the majority does not know, the minority does not know, and there is no way of knowing for whom those people voted. Even if there were 700 illegal votes, we do not know who they voted for. Uh, we do know, for example, as a hint as to how they might have voted, that, uh, and I think the majority would agree with this analysis, that approximately 25 percent, if not more, of those voters were registered Republicans. Another 15 percent, at least or so, were registered independents. Uh, to characterize the 700 votes, uh, if in fact there were 700 illegal votes, as coming out of Ms. Sanchez's victory margin is wholly unsupportable, and the evidence that we do have suggests that it is, it is flat out uh, an inaccurate statement. And uh, I think it's very, very important for uh, everyone here to understand that, that that number 700, uh, while it, the number itself uh, is questionable, characterizing it as uh, being votes out of Ms. Sanchez's victory margin is, is an absolutely improper thing to do, and I think we need to clarify uh, that point. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, to, to wrap up the presentation, uh, I would like to go th run through the numbers, and uh, if we can look at the, the chart over on the right, the second chart, our person seems to have disappeared who is going to. And we will, we will remove the post-it notes as we go down and so that you can follow the sequence that Mr. Kelleher outlined. Mr. First of all... Mr. Chairman, while you're doing that, do we have 8 by 10s of this chart? Uh, I'm just getting them because the ones I was given to hand out were outdated. Uh, they've been superseded. So I can give you the old ones. It may help, but it's different from the chart. All right, if, we, if you could remove the top post-it note, Maria. That is the an original number of suspect votes that the staff uh, uncovered. In other words, these, after going through all the computer matches and looking at the different op options before they screening them for errors on the part of the INS, screening for errors on the parts of others, there were 7,841 uh, suspect votes. In other words, issues that had to be examined in more detail. The, uh, if you remove the upper left-hand post-it, you will find that a large number of those were, in fact, legitimate registrants, but the INS records were in error as listing them initially as being non-citizens. So the 7,481 uh, 7 was reduced by the 5,348 who did turn out to be legitimate. And a point I'd like to emphasize here is that the task force did not jump to conclusions. We did not simply look at the 7,841 votes and say, oh, it's a huge margin of improper votes and, and make our decision on that basis. A great deal of effort was expended, frankly, to reduce the size of the number. We might argue about the size of the bottom number we'll get to, but this was an honest, genuine effort 
to, uh, to have the most accurate result possible. And so from here on, you'll see the numbers going down. If you remove the upper right posted, that leaves 2,493 that uh, are, are suspect registrants. Then continuing the examination, if you move the next one, the left-hand side, it turns out that the suspect registrant, in other words, these are people who very likely uh, were illegal registrants. They had registered even though they were non-citizens, but 1,718 of them did not vote in the November 1996 election. So they are out of the picture. Going to the right-hand side, the number that leaves the number who voted actually voted at 820. Next, uh, the left-hand side, continue, continuing with the investigation and trying to verify, uh, there's documented evidence that 624 illegal non-citizens voted. In other words, they were non-citizens and had registered to vote and voted. On the right-hand side, that leaves 196 in which the evidence is circumstantial rather than documented. And uh, frankly, I, I in good conscience could not include those because the circumstantial evidence did not meet the standards that I think this task force has to meet in determining whether or not they voted illegally. So to the 624, you add, removing the next posted on the left, and you may have to hold up the chart because we can't see it at this point from here, uh, that we had to add to that 124 absentee ballots that were disallowed by the Orange County Registrar. And that was the number that we had uh, certainly from the beginning. Add the 624 and the 124 and remove the next post-it and we have documented evidence of 748 illegal votes. And that's the number that I think we have to consider uh, bef before this task force. If you remove the other post-its, you'll note that circumstantial evidence of 196, if we would wish to add that in, is a total of 944 uh, suspect votes, including both categories. But I think we should concentrate on the 748 and that I am uh, I'm comfor very comfortable saying that is the most likely number of illegal votes cast in this election. That, as the task force well knows, is less than the 979 vote margin. Uh, many people incidentally say it's 984 votes. It's a minor technicality, but the actual number after the recount was 979 votes. So 979 vote margin, 748 documented illegal votes. And it's uh, our, my judgment, and I believe it will be the judgment of this task force as well, that there is, there's not enough evidence of a sufficient number of illegal votes to consider vacating the election, uh, which would mean if we vacate the election, we simply ask the state of California to conduct a new election and uh, go through the whole process. So it's the rec my recommendation to the task force, and we'll uh, introduce a resolution to that effect and then discuss it and answer, uh, permit everyone to ask questions and discuss that. It's my recommendation that we uh, dismiss the election, and I will turn to Mr. Ney for introduction of a resolution that would Mr. accomplish Chairman, that. Please. Yes. Uh, I, I've seen the resolution, but I, I want to reiterate and have on the record uh, just to preserve it in case anything happens that uh, is unforeseen, that uh, we had made a request for a minority witness day. Uh, it's my understanding that procedurally I need to make that point at this point in time to reserve that right. Obviously, if the case ends, uh, perhaps that is a moot point, but I make that uh, point now uh, so that I can preserve that, uh, uh, that right. You, you recall, Mr. Chairman, I made a request uh, for uh, minority witnesses, which I understand we haven't a right to under the rules. Now, obviously, if the case is dismissed, as I understand you're going to recommend, uh, perhaps that becomes moot, but I want to preserve uh, that right uh, for whatever eventuality might occur. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. Uh, I would uh, just simply point out this, this is not a hearing, and so we're not taking testimony at this meeting. Um, we, we can pursue that if you wish to ask it, and we can get a parliamentary ruling on that. 
but uh, this is not a hearing at this point. It's simply a meeting to consider the results of the investigation. I'll turn to Mr. Nay for our introduction it, of the is resolution. This, is this not a task force meeting? Pardon? I'm, I'm not sure I understand. This is Mr. a task force meeting, but it is not a, not a hearing. No witnesses are being uh, in, uh, allowed to testify other than the staff members and the attorneys. I, I understand that. I just simply want to preserve uh, and, and have it on the record that I am asking for the minority, uh, the, the opportunity for minority witnesses. I understand this hearing is not for witnesses, although I would question whether or not uh, Mr. Kelleher is a witness or counsel. I understand what you're saying, but it seems to me he's operating in both capacities at this point in time. Nevertheless, uh, what I'm trying to do is, I in the eventuality that that would be necessary, in other words, that this matter were not uh, dismissed, that I would c continue to maintain that right. Well, we'll note for the record that you've indicated your, your desire. I would uh, simply comment, I have received requests from uh, from the uh, other side of the issue to testify, and I've told them also that we are not taking testimony at this meeting. So if, if you, uh, as I say, if you wish to pursue it later on, we will pursue that. But at the moment, we'll introduce the resolution and discuss that. Mr. Ney. Mr. Chairman, I move that the task force agree to the resolution and request that the Committee on House Oversight report the resolution favorably to the House. The question is the adoption of the resolution. Uh, since there has not been an opportunity for the minority to, uh, or for Mr. Ney to ask questions of uh, either the presentation or the attorneys, <coughs> I will uh, grant the leeway to include that in the discussion that will take place. Uh, we do have a vote coming up. This might be an opportune time to run over quickly and vote before we get into this. But uh, if the so I will declare a recess while we uh, go to the floor for the vote, unless. We're expecting two votes in sequence. Uh, did you it's hear? It's a series. It is a series. Just Committee is in recess. Uh, we will go vote. It appears there's only one vote. Meeting will, <coughs> meeting will come to order. Uh, we are on a time limit because um, we have two more. We have a motion to recommit on the floor, which is de being debated as we speak. Uh, then there will be a 15-minute vote on that, followed. Sure glad we had a legal counsel here to help us. <laughs> it's always good to have a legal counsel to tell us what the important things. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, just uh, to announce to everyone, there's a motion to recommit being debated on the floor now. There's 10 minutes for uh, debate, followed by a 15-minute vote, and followed by a 15-minute vote on passage. I estimate this will give us at least 15 to 20 minutes to discuss and debate here. I hope that's enough time to conclude this task force meeting, but if not, we'll carry on after the two votes are taken. Uh, Mr. Ney has uh, introduced a resolution and made a motion. 
And I have no uh, comment on it, so we will turn to the gentleman from Maryland for any uh, questions he might have on the presentation or comments about the resolution. Mr. Chairman, I have a uh, substitute motion. And I would ask for the reading of the motion. And this is, uh, you're offering this in the nature of a substitute to a substitute, uh, substitute, uh, substitute to Mr. Nace. In the nature of a substitute. Yes, sir. Yes. All right, you may proceed to uh, explain it and discuss it. Uh, I would like the motion read, Mr. Chairman. You may read it if you wish. <laughs> Where's the clerk? I don't know. I, I'd be glad to read it, Mr. Chairman. I would presume that will not take up my debate time. No, we will not count that. Whereas Loretta Sanchez was issued a certificate of election as the duly elected member of Congress in the 46th District of California by the Secretary of State of California and was seated by the United States House of Representatives on January 7, 1997. And whereas a notice of contest of election was filed with the Clerk of the House by Mr. Robert Dorman, Dornan on December 26, 1996. And whereas prior to today, the Task Force on Contested Elections in the 46th <coughs> District of California met on February 26, 97 in Washington, D.C., on April 19, 1997 in Orange County, California, and on October 24, 1997 in Washington, D.C., and Whereas Mr. Robert Dorman made unsubstantiated charges of improper voting from a business rather than a resident address, underage voting, double voting, and large numbers of individuals voting from the same address. And whereas these charges are without merit, as it was found that those voting from the same address included United States Marines residing at Marine Barracks and nuns residing at Domicile of Nuns, that business addresses were legal residents for the individuals, including the zookeeper of the Santa Ana Zoo, that duplicate voting was by different individuals, and those accused of underage voting, uh, two in number, uh, were of age. And whereas the Committee on House Oversight has issued uh, unprecedented su subpoenas directing the Immigration and Naturalization Service to compare its records with Orange County voter registration records, the first time in any election in the history of the United States that the INS has been asked by Congress to verify citizenship of voters, and whereas the INS has complied with the committee's request for information. The INS has responded to more than 20 separate committee requests for either electronic data matches or paper file reviews. Further, the INS provided the committee with a list of over 500,000 names and approximately 8,000 worksheets uh, and nearly 3,700 signatures. The INS's efforts have involved the resources of over 72 different INS field offices to potential cost of a million dollars. And whereas the committee's investigation has extended beyond uh, a review of those who actually voted in this contested election, and whereas the district attorney of Orange County has ended his investigation, and an Orange County grand jury has refused to return any indictments, and allegations of a conspiracy to engage in voter fraud have been shown to be groundless, and whereas the Committee on House Oversight has received a report from the Secretary of State of California in response to the committee's request, which yielded no new information beyond that which was in the position, possession of the committee at the time of the request. And whereas the committee's request, requests have caused this contest to be needlessly extended for four additional months while the Secretary of State of California provided that no new information uh, regarding the citizenship status of registrants or voters, and whereas the task force on the contested election in the 46th District of California and the committee have been reviewing these materials, and a review of these materials shows there is not sufficient credible evidence demonstrating any outcome other than uh, that Congressman, Congresswoman Sanchez did, in fact, win this election. And whereas a uh, contestant, Robert Dornan, has not shown or provided credible evidence that the outcome of the election is other than Congresswoman Sanchez's election to the Congress, and whereas this process has been needlessly prolonged at great expense to Congresswoman Sanchez, and I might add, although it is not incorporated in the resolution to Mr. Dornan as well, now therefore be it resolved that the contestee's pending motion to dismiss the election contest concerning the 46th District of California is granted, and pursuant to 2 U.S.C. 396 and long-standing committee policy, the Committee on House Oversight shall process for payment all reasonable expenses of contestee Loretta Sanchez, including uh, reasonable attorney's fees. 
Mr. Chairman, uh, if I might be heard on the resolution. Yes, you may. Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, it is my understanding that uh, uh, whichever motion is ultimately passed, that I will be pleased with the outcome of today's proceedings. However, as you know, Mr. Chairman, as we have discussed, I have not been pleased with the proceedings, the process, uh, and the practices which have been pursued. I want to make it clear that that which has been presented today is the first time I have heard it. Uh, I have no written uh, information with reference to the majority's consideration of all this information. This information has, I, I hasten to add, uh, been made available for review by our staff. But contrary to my suggestion and hope, uh, there was never a time when to together we considered the uh, substantive uh, evidence that was gathered by the committee. Uh, clearly the evidence adduced by the parties in this case was minimal at best. And so that uh, the material uh, arrayed before us is the material uh, and the only material which Mr. Kelleher spoke to. Uh, he did not speak, as, as I recall, to any of Mr. Dornan's initial allegations, except to the extent uh, the allegations referred to illegal voting. The specifics, of course, were not referenced because uh, long ago we decided they were without merit. From the very inception of this contest, we have been dealing with unfounded allegations. I believe that to be the case when they were originally made, and I believe we should have followed precedent and dismissed this case long ago with great savings uh, in money and consternation to both parties. Uh, Mr. Dornan's initial allegations, in my opinion, proved groundless. The committee response was to give him subpoena power, contrary to past practice under the Republican leadership of this committee, uh, wherein in the Rose case and in, and in the Gadenson case, uh, we did have hearings. Uh, one was here and one was a field hearing. Neither triggered discovery. Uh, the committee very consciously, in my opinion, uh, triggered discovery in this case, and I think Mr. Schweitzer has been quite honest in his assessment. That was his intent, it, the committee's intent, because it wanted to uh, pursue that and felt that was the proper practice. Uh, throughout the course of this case, unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, uh, the minority has had little, if any, input into how we proceed and little knowledge of how we were proceeding. I want to make it clear that when we did receive information, uh, sometimes later than sooner and sometimes uh, uh, shortly after its receipt, we did receive the information, although in many instances we did not receive the questions that were asked. Obviously, both are necessary to make an effective uh, analysis. Uh, I want to make it uh, clear that uh, uh, contrary to the assertions of many on this committee uh, who said definitively and uh, without doubt that crimes had been committed, and that is the assertion here today, although not as specifically as they were made before. The district attorney, Mr. Capizzi, a Republican, who in my opinion has done his job fairly uh, and thoroughly uh, and without uh, reference to uh, uh, publicity, uh, presented uh, presumably all the information he could gather from organizations and from individuals. And the ju grand jury did not find probable cause that the uh, uh, that crimes were committed, uh, did not find uh, probable cause that crimes were committed by organizations, and did not find probable cause uh, to indict either individuals or organizations. Now, M Mr. Chairman, I, again, I see the light, but Mr. Kelleher had a long time, and I hope that you would be, uh, in light of the fact this appears to be the last meeting of our task force, give me a little additional time. I. Uh I want to make sure we give time for both sides. There will definitely be, if there's not enough time now, second round. Our, c our concern now is that we have a vote on. <laughs> and so uh, I would like would you to, want to end have now a response. Just take another minute, and then we'll have a response, and then we'll go vote. I want to uh, uh, respond, although I cannot do so specifically because I have not had the opportunity to uh, review the analysis of the majority. This is the first report that I've had on that. That's the first opportunity I've had to know even what the majority thought the numbers were. 
and have had no opportunity to see any names uh, that the majority claims uh, were not authorized voters. To this very time, notwithstanding the fact we're going to take action, as I understand, proposed by the chair and Mr. Ney to dismiss this case, the minority has not seen any one of the 628. I don't know which names you're talking about. I don't know which names you're talking about of the others. Uh, the 124, obviously, we all know uh, about, and I would uh, uh, observe that uh, those voters were not necessarily, uh, save one, perhaps, of the 124, uh, improperly registered voters, and they are citizens. Uh, there was a question as to whether they were properly delivered. Very frankly, uh, under the precedence of uh, uh, this uh, uh, committee, uh, where there were procedural deficiencies as opposed to substantive fraudulent uh, illegal deficiencies, uh, as Ms. Lever pointed out, she normally would have accepted these. Uh, but under the uh, uh, facts of this uh, case and the circumstances, uh, she decided that uh, uh, they should not be. That is uh, probably prudent on her part and, and, and great care on her part, but it ought to be made very clear that all of those people, as far as we know, save one, were citizens. Uh, I've said that the INS investigation, which indicated this, is unprecedented. I have made the point before, and I want to make it clear. I do not uh, make any allegations of any bad motives or wrongdoing, but it is clear that this is an unprecedented uh, case. Uh, I've made the point that the Irish in Boston were never confronted with this. The Italians in Providence, Rhode Island were never confronted with this. The Poles in Chicago were never confronted with this. The Jews in New York were never confronted uh, with this. This is an unprecedented uh, focus on a particular uh, group of people. I do not allege that that was the reason for the focus. But if you are in that group of Hispanic Americans and you look at the previous history of this country where large minorities have moved in uh, to districts and made substantial political differences, it is not hard to understand why they believe that there was a unique and historic focus on the Hispanic population. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe it appropriate uh, uh, that uh, you take the action that you are proposing today. But I want to, in closing, because my time is up and we have to vote, uh, uh, but I want to uh, include my statement in full for the record, obviously, uh, I want to make it uh, clear. Contrary to some press reports, quoting some leaders of this Congress, at no time was there any allegation made that Mrs. Sanchez, Congresswoman Sanchez, did anything wrong. She was not a subject of this investigation. In fact, uh, this is tangential. Uh, she is involved in it because she was the uh, person elected. But it ought to be made very, very clear that at no time was Mrs. Sanchez ever involved in any allegations uh, from this committee or anybody else uh, that she did anything wrong. It is extraordinary that she has continued to represent her district as well as she has during the proceedings. Uh, I have included, Mr. Chairman, in my resolution, as you, as you noted when I read it, uh, a uh, request uh, uh, and, and uh, authorization for compensation of Mrs. Sanchez. Uh, again, not, she did nothing wrong. Whatever happened in the uh, District of California, which I believe is still unclear, and I want to make it clear that those 628, in my opinion, uh, first of all, are much higher than the number we have, uh, we believe is uh, even in question, but secondly and most assuredly are not confirmed as illegal voters. Whatever, uh, uh, Mr. Kelleher, and I have nothing before me, no report before me, no evidence before me, nothing cited before me, uh, if I were a litigant in this case, I would be very upset that I didn't know what was going on. Uh, but I'm a member of the task force, and I don't know what's going on. And uh, that upsets me as well. But Mrs. Sanchez, notwithstanding all this, has continued to represent her district well. I think, Mr. Chairman, and I want to congratulate you. I know that you have, uh, uh, on, on, on the recommendation uh, uh, that you have made in your resolution, I would hope that our resolution uh, substitute would be adopted uh, to cover the compensation for Mrs. Sanchez. I think that's fair and appropriate and provided for, as you well know, in the Federal Contested Election Act. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hoyer.
I will make just a few comments, and then we will have to recess to go vote before uh, Mr. Ney is recognized for his response. I want to make it clear that throughout the discussion, I have never, uh, in fact, I've made it very clear that we have never seen any evidence of any wrongdoing on the part of Ms. Sanchez, and so I'll corroborate what you said there. Uh, I, and uh, I've made that clear to her and to the media as well. Uh, you also commented that Mr. Dornan's allegations were without merit. I think the fact that we've ended up with 748 votes uh, that we believe are documented as being illegal is, makes it clear that his allegations had merit, not necessarily all of them, uh, but certainly uh, one of them, and well, in fact two, the absentees plus the others. The, uh, you made several references uh, to the to not knowing what was going on, and I just want to make it clear. First of all, the majority of the names that are there were made available to the minority and to you early on. The absentee ballots and the 305 names that were submitted by the California Secretary of State. Mr. Chairman, just to clarify, so we know what I meant. I, I agree with that. I made clear that you the uh, the responses were given to us, and I want to make it clear that that was done. I do not know which 628 names. Uh, you, uh, you the, Mr. Kelleher, is referring to that includes the 305, that and that's the only point I'm making. Yeah, but I, now, but I don't know which ones they are. That was yeah, my point. Reclaiming my time, uh, I would point out that uh, that I spoke to the gentleman from Maryland a number of times, and said I did not see the need for a, f a further task force meeting until the analysis was finished, and also commented that if it appeared that there were sufficient vo votes to vacate the election then we would immediately have a discussion on, and he, they, uh, you would be allowed to review all the data that we've accumulated and critique it. In view of the fact that we reached the conclusion there were not enough votes, I felt it was not necessary to go through that process, but you are certainly free to examine them, and any of your staff who has signed the confidentiality agreements can examine them, and uh, if, it's of, if it's of any import to you. But I want to assure you and everyone present of my confidence in the documented numbers. It's the... Uh, the, f the circumstantial evidence numbers that I think are questionable and which you would also find questionable. Finally, uh, uh, very quickly, just refer to an issue that's been raised a lot of times on the floor debate and, and for the first time in my life I've been uh, referred to, uh, sometimes directly, sometimes inferentially, as racist, sexist, etc., and that we are targeting Hispanics. I think everyone would be surprised at the number of non-Hispanics who are included in the files. Uh, large numbers of immigrants come from other lands other than uh, Spanish-speaking countries. And uh, this in no way was targeted toward Hispanics or either in terms of proving that they had voted illegally or done anything wrong or, as has been alleged, to intimidate them so that they won't vote again. Uh, there's absolutely no intent on my part and on the task force's part and the committee's part to do that. And uh, I, I frankly object very strongly to that comment. I will conclude my comments here, and Mr. Ney, uh, we have to go vote unless you can come in in two Maybe minutes or less. No, I just have one quick question, if I can, and I'll come back and have some comments. I'd like to ask Mr. Ballantyne, uh, you said you had less. What, what's your number you came up with? Uh, Mr. Ney, at this time, I'm not prepared to give exactly what that number is, but the staff has uh, uh, done an analysis and I think is currently in the process of analyzing what the majority has done, and I, and I think we'll have some specific comments on uh, what number we think is more appropriate, but I don't have it myself right this time. So you, you don't feel confident enough that you thoroughly went through this in the last few months to come up with a number? Well, well I think what we'd like to do is respond to the majority's analysis, but uh, we do have categories of, of voters that we think are in that number that do not belong in that number. We should reduce it fairly significantly. Well, let me get straight. So you, <clears throat> but you question where your number I'll, I'll, give you an, I'll give you an example. We, we, th we think, and again, we don't know enough about what the majority's done, but we think the majority number includes, for example, some voters who may have registered as many as 20 years okay. ago. And I, it, your statement was, included. if I remember right, it was you know, much lower and you felt so firm about it, I thought maybe you'd want to share the number now and then we could compare them. Yeah. You want to wait a little bit. We'd like to okay, wait. thanks. All right, we will have to recess for the vote. When we re reassemble, Mr. Ney will continue. <coughs> the meeting stands in recess. What else?
The task force will come to order. And first up is Mr. Nay to continue uh, any questions or comments he might wish to make. And uh, I would very much like to wrap this up soon because we're going to repeat all of this in the House Oversight Committee, which will start as soon as this meeting finishes. Mr. Nay. Yes, sir. I, <coughs> Mr. Chair, I just want to make a couple comments. I appreciate. Uh, the work of, of all members of the task force and the staff of both sides, uh, no matter who reaches what conclusion, there was a lot of time uh, and effort put into it by both sides. And uh, I guess the, the one thing I wanted to point out, that this never was intended uh, to be an issue of who, in fact, uh, we would want to be seated in this seat. Uh, we obviously followed, uh, I think, the rules, unlike example in the past we all know of, that. Uh, somebody wasn't seated. We seated Congresswoman Sanchez. Uh, she was able to conduct her duties as a member of Congress. But I think the one thing I've got to just note that there are a few things in here, and I really can't comment as to right after the election of the, you know, the Marine barracks or the zookeeper, but I know that the 700 some names we have are not zookeepers or nuns or Marine barracks. And as far as the word unsubstantiated, the fact remains that, that Bob Dornan was right. Bob Dornan contended that there were illegal voters. There were illegal voters. Therefore, Bob Dornan was correct in the assertion that, that illegal voters existed. And in the United States congressional election, people who were non-citizens, I'm not saying it was their fault, maybe they didn't understand what was going on or you know, whatever circumstances occur, but the fact remains that there were illegal voters. As far as unprecedented, I think we, because of the, of the fact this, this was contested, starts, maybe it was unprecedented in some people's minds, but it sets a precedent that we, the United States Congress, are going to investigate illegal voters or voter fraud, and we're going to get down to the bottom of it. And I think what comes out of this whole thing is, uh, uh, you know, not who is particularly sitting where today, but I think what comes out of it is that we need to work together to make sure that, that people are registered legally and that the system works. Otherwise, people don't have faith in the United States electoral voting system. Um, you know, we found evidence of 1,700 uh, more illegal registrations. They didn't vote. They could have. Wonder what difference that would have made, or in the Gageson race, what difference it would have made, or in the John Fox race, what difference it would have made. It, it might have made a difference, obviously, if you look at some of the clo close contests in the past. And I don't think we can we can uh, tolerate uh, substantial numbers, and I consider them substantial numbers. Uh, we confirmed that 60 percent of Vermont and Nationals registrations were illegal. That's what we've confirmed. Uh, a lot of witnesses are now in Mexico, so unfortunately, we can't talk to them. But I believe that uh, if it was unprecedented, it has set a good precedent that we, the U.S. House, will stand up for uh, proper elections, and that is what we will settle for, totally accurate, proper elections where people vote legally. But I just want to just say I, I think it's a good report we have. We haven't put a lot of uh, things in the report. You know, we could have. I think it's a straight-out report, and that, again, the charges were that there were illegal voters. The reality was is that there are illegal voters, and I just think we uh, did, did a good thing, and uh, we can set a working relationship together to make sure that elections are conducted in the best possible manner anywhere in the United States. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. Um, I want to agree with you that if, in fact, there is fraud, that ought to be investigated. In point of fact, of course, the district attorney, Mr. Capizzi, pursued this. Uh, he pursued it presumably with all of the information uh, uh, he could garner. Uh, and if there were illegal acts done, then I want to make it clear on this side, we think they ought to be prosecuted uh, 
uh, an action ought to be taken. We ought not to uh, uh, condone or participate in illegal election activities. We agree with that 100 percent. Uh, our position, however, is and, and uh, uh, our belief was uh, that when the district attorney took this to the grand jury, apparently the grand jury, for whatever reasons, did not conclude, and the, the organization has been mentioned frequently, that they committed a crime. They weren't indicted. Uh, Mr. Lopez was not indicted. Uh, others were not indicted. Uh, because presumably the grand jury found that there was not probable cause either to believe that a crime had been committed or that A, B, C, or D uh, prospective defendants committed a crime. That's the way the grand jury uh, works. They don't need uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, they just need probable cause. Um, so I, we agree that that needs to be uh, looked at and ferreted out. Uh, the only second comment I would make is that uh, you mentioned a report I think it's a good report. Uh, am I incorrect that there is no report existing? Is there is there a report existing? Let oh, me yes. ask a question. Resolution. Re uh, the resolution. I'm sorry. Said report meant resolution. My error. And and simply say to the gentleman, I think it will be useful and important to review the 628 to see a if we agree and if so, what further action ought to be taken, if any. Will the gentleman yield? Just to uh, respond to the rhetorical question you raised about how this would have affected other elections, I actually went back and looked uh, for the past 20 years. I can give the statistics very quickly for the last 10 because I calculated that. And uh, if this number of votes had, uh, had been illegally cast in elections in the past 10 years, uh, there were uh, 12 elections that would have been vacated or overturned as a result. Uh, so it is a substantial number of votes we're talking about. It would have had a real <coughs> impact over the previous Congresses. I, I uh, note your time has elapsed. Mr. Chairman, would you yield on that point? Because I think if we're establishing precedent, uh, I want to very strongly disagree with a precedent that presumes if a victory was by 800 and there were 800 votes improperly cast, the precedents are that, that those votes are either proportionally distributed because one cannot presume that all of the votes were cast for Mrs. Sanchez or for the winning candidate. There's no way one can presume that, and if one did, one would clearly be in error. As a result, uh, it is our position in terms of precedent, the precedents clearly have dealt with this, case, this kind of case in the past, and they have distributed votes in a proportional, usually by precinct, uh, pattern uh, so that we could fairly uh, distribute and then determine whether or not the election was uh, in, uh, in question. The premise that uh, Mr. Campbell articulated in his article in Roll Call and that you seem to adopt is not a precedent that we believe, A, is, is, we're not establishing it, I understand, in this case because this is not uh, going to be dispositive on that issue, but it is not a precedent that I think is, uh, ought to be uh, discussed with favor even in the uh, discussions of this case because I think it's not consistent with former precedents and is not a proper policy to uh, uh, adhere to. Well, I, I don't want to get into a debate on this, uh, Mr. Hoyer, but I would just point out that there are many different precedents established because practices have differed quite a bit over the years on that point in the Congresses. I, I believe we've had enough discussion on the uh, Amendment in the nature of a substitute. The question is on the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by the gentleman from Maryland. All those in favor of the amendment in the nature of a substitute will say aye. Aye. Those opposed will say no. 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 I know the record's going to reflect it, but why don't you have a roll call just so we'll the record will the, reflect uh, it. The, we'll ask the clerk to read the roll. Mr. Ney? No. Mr. Hoyer? Aye. Mr. Ehlers? No. What is the report? One in the affirmative, two in the negative. Thank you. Mr. The, Chairman. Uh, the amendment in the nature of substitute fails. Mr. Chairman, on the uh, pending resolution, briefly. Mr. Chairman, very, I will vote for the pending resolution, but I want to make it clear on the record it is not because I adopt the premises uh, incorporated in the whereas clauses. I, I, I do not believe that INS uh, or the Department of Justice has been recalcitrant in any of their responsibilities or responses. Uh, we, we issued a, a, a request, a subpoena, if you will, on the 14th of May. 
Mr. Keller indicated that we had a response on the 24th of May, 10 days later. That does not indicate, in my opinion, either recalcitrance and 8,000 documents, uh, uh, 72 different offices being involved and thousands of hours by INS and perhaps up to a million dollars of cost does not indicate a, an unwillingness to uh, uh, cooperate and provide this committee with uh, information. Uh, and, but, but I will, as, as I said, vote for the resolution uh, because I believe the dismissal of this case, although very late, is nevertheless appropriate. Is there any further comment on the resolution offered by Mr. Ney? I just have to make one, uh, one quick response on that. The difficulty was not with the actions of the INS after they received the subpoena. The problem was their failure to respond and the necessity to issue subpoenas, which took three months of our effort. <laughs> had, had they not uh, shut down the operation uh, that was going in Southern California between the California Secretary of State and the local office of the INS, uh, we could have resolved this much sooner. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, we've had the same problem I, on this I'm, side. I have the floor. <laughs> the, um, the other issue is on Department of Justice failure to enforce the subpoenas which were issued. And I think that also has uh, uh, caused a great deal of delay. The question is on the adoption of the, uh, the resolution put forward by Mr. Ney. All those in favor of the resolution will say aye. 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 Those opposed, it's unanimous. The resolution is adopted and it is referred to the Committee on House Oversight for consideration. Uh, the motion is agreed to. The chair will report the task force recommendation in this matter to the committee, which will be meeting immediately at the conclusion of this meeting. Being no further uh, business to come before this task force, it was with great delight that I note this is the last meeting of the task force, and I declare the meeting adjourned. Oversight Committee will uh, come to order. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the task force on uh, California contested election has a report, and uh, the chair would lay before the committee an original resolution and ask for its immediate consideration. I'd recognize the uh, gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Nay, for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that the resolution be reported favorably to the House. Um, gentleman from Michigan, the chairman of the task force, wish to be recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've just concluded a task force meeting, which we uh, thought would be considerably shorter, but we had considerable discussion as well as interruption by several votes. Uh, in an effort to, uh, to shorten the report, I will simply give a short synopsis of the results of the investigation. And um, if there are any detailed questions, we have attorneys for both sides here, as well as the staff who did all the detailed analysis. Well, let me uh, begin by saying that I believe the most important right of citizens in a democracy is the right to ensure that they will be able to vote, that their vote will be counted accurately, and that those who are not eligible to vote will not dilute their vote, their, the uh, legal voters' vote, by casting illegal ballots. And that's the 
basis of our democratic system of government and representation that each and every person be allowed to vote if they were citizens and that they be assured that their vote be counted and tallied appropriately. The uh, contested election act is, uh, or pardon me, the process of contested elections is uh, established in the Constitution and through law. And we try to fulfill that constitutional and statutory obligation to the best of our ability. We conducted a field hearing in California. We have had two meetings of the task force in this community. Uh, we have had additional discussions between the minority and the majority of, over details of this. But most of the work over the past several months has been analysis, very detailed analysis by the staff of votes that were considered to be suspect, individuals who may have voted illegally. Uh, we will pass out a chart which summarizes the numbers, and I will not go through all the details of the process by which the original number of suspect votes was determined, but uh, is the chart handed out? Will you please hand out the chart to everyone? If you look at the top of the chart, just hand several each way and we can pass them on. If you look at the top of the chart, that is the original number of suspect votes, which was obtained after a detailed electronic comparison between the records of the INS and the Orange County Registrar of Voters. In addition, there were other sources that were uh, obtained, such as uh, jury records where people had declined to serve on the jury by virtue of not being citizens. Of border crossing cards, et cetera. There's a long, detailed process which uh, can be explained to any member who wishes to have further details. The original number that resulted from all of that was 7,841 votes. If you look at the next number to the left, a detailed review of INS files indicated that even though their initial records had indicated that the person was not a citizen, uh, 5,348 cases were found where, in fact, they were citizens and the INS records had not shown that upon initial examination. That left the number to the right, 2,493 as suspect registrants. Going down to the next level on the left, there were 1,718 suspect registrants who did not vote in the no November 1996 election, leaving 820 who did vote and were suspected of not uh, being legal voters. Very detailed examination then took place for those 820. Uh, we have a documented evidence that 620 of those, four of those, were illegal non-citizens voters. And uh, in addition to that, there is circumstantial evidence that 196 may have been non-citizens at the time they registered or voted. Adding 124 to the, uh, to the 624, and the 124 represents absentee ballots, which from the beginning were disallowed by the Orange County Register upon uh, examination after the contest was filed. And we have then documented evidence of 748 illegal votes. Circumstantial evidence of 196, in which cases we cannot come up with definitive proof that yields a total of 944. The task force, upon my recommendation, accepted the 748 as an indication of the number of illegal votes, a documented evidence of illegal votes. And uh, since the margin of victory in this particular election was 979, it is clear that 748 is less than 949. Therefore, uh, the recommendation of the task force is the resolution which you have before us, and that is that we dismiss the con contested election, the contest which was filed by Mr. Dornan against the contestee, uh, Loretta Sanchez, and that uh, the issue be closed. The resolution also specifies the number of problems that we encountered in the, in the course of our investigation, lack of cooperation by the Department of Justice in failing to enforce, enforce subpoenas which were rendered, uh, initial lack of cooperation by the Immigration and Naturalization Service, 
uh, obstruction by groups who were issued subpoenas and did not respond to them and chose, in fact, to go to court to uh, claim they were not uh, constitutional. Uh, the court has ruled that they are constitutional. And perhaps, Mr. Chairman, the most important uh, development in the task force's work, other than resolving the issue before us, was the precedent that was established for the first time under the Contested Elections Act to provide for adequate discovery in cases such as this. And we have been very, very careful throughout the whole course of investigation by the task force that we are aware that we were establishing precedent, and we've been very careful to do so properly and with uh, thought. And I believe we have now established a case history that will be useful in future contested elections. I thank you for the opportunity to submit my report and be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. I assume a gentleman from Connecticut wishes me to recognize the member of the task force, gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Hoyer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, on behalf of myself as a member of the task force, let me say that quite obviously I'm pleased with the uh, majority's recommendation in this case that this uh, case be dismissed and, in effect, the motion to dismiss uh, filed by Mrs. Sanchez be uh, approved. Uh, I am not, however, as the chairman knows, uh, the chairman of the task force knows, uh, pleased with the process. Uh, and I would comment on the procedural precedents that were set. If I were a litigant in this case, I would not be a happy camper on either side. They were not given time frames in which to uh, complete uh, uh, discovery. Uh, they were, uh, uh, d uh, frankly, m Mr. Sanchez did not receive as is required under the statute, uh, documents from Mr. Uh, uh, Dornan in terms of uh, depositions. Uh, as a matter of fact, the committee didn't receive them uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, dates were given to Mrs. Sanchez uh, uh, that were after the fact. That is to say, her discovery period was announced to her after it had ended. Uh, so that from a procedural standpoint, I would hope this is not a precedent for a future case. Uh, for either uh, contestant or contestee, because if it is, it will not be a good precedent in terms of how one tr uh, processes a case, affects discovery, provides the results of that discovery to the other side, and allows the other side to respond to it. In fact, we are disposing of this case, of course, uh, uh, which I think is appropriate and proper, uh, and as I said to the press, it's never too late to do the right thing. I also want to comment, uh, Mr. Chairman, on the fact that uh, on behalf of the minority, we feel that we have not been included in the process of consideration of the material. I have received the material. The task force has received the material we've received from INS and others. But we have not been privy to the consideration that the staff has given to that material. Uh, when I say that, there is nobody around this table that knows who these 628 are, I dare say. Perhaps the chairman does. Uh, perhaps Mr. Ney does. I don't. I have not seen them. I have not had any report other than a conclusionary document setting forth numbers. That's all I have received. That's the total sum and substance of the result of this investigation that I have received. That's it. I believe Mr. Dorn and Mrs. Sanchez have received less than this. As a result, it is very difficult for me to comment on the uh, numbers that have been uh, referenced by the chairman. Suffice it to say that we believe that this number is uh, uh, probably half of this. We can't confirm that because we don't know who these are. Therefore, can't make a comparison or an analysis. But it is our belief that uh, uh, this number is probably half as large at best. And when I say at best, we have not confirmed, nor has the majority confirmed, that these votes were cast improperly. It has made a conclusion from paper that it has received from records referenced by INS as unreliable at best. In fact, Mr. Kelleher in his report, report clearly indicated that many of them were uh, unreliable and that they, in fact, found 
uh, that they were not to be uh, uh, followed, and his numbers reflect some calling out of those numbers. Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to also add briefly that uh, I emphasized at the task force that at no time was Mrs. Sanchez ever alleged to have done anything wrong. She did not do anything wrong. She won this election fair and square, and I am pleased that we are dismissing uh, this case. Under the Federal Contested Election Act, uh, this committee can uh, reimburse reasonable expenses uh, for the, con uh, the, the parties in this case. Uh, I offered a resolution. It was rejected by the task force. I will offer another resolution at the time of the consideration of this one as an addition uh, to compensate uh, Mrs. Uh, Sanchez for the expenses that she has incurred as a result of this <coughs> contest, which has been dismissed without any finding of wrongdoing by Mrs. Sanchez. I think that's appropriate not only for Mrs. Sanchez, but I think it's an appropriate protection for every member uh, duly elected uh, to this House and that is confirmed as having been duly elected uh, by this committee and by the Congress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentleman from Maryland. Gentleman from Ohio, a member of the task force, wish to make a statement? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that the precedence that was set here today, the precedence that was set when we embarked on this, is that the United States House is not going to tolerate uh, shutting its eyes to the fact that there are illegal voters in the United States Congressional election. Now, I don't know what, at what threshold uh, one's comfortable or not with illegal voters, but the fact remains that we found evidence of 700 illegal voters. The fact remains that two-thirds of the 979 margin of victory, and I'm not going to debate who they would have went to, I don't know, you know, who would have crossed over what party lines to vote for which candidate, but two-thirds of those votes, two-thirds of them, were people who were illegal voters. The task force uh, found evidence of over 1,700 more illegal registrations. Also, something that I think needs to be pointed out, the task force confirmed that 60 percent of Vermont Dodd's registrations were illegal. So American taxpayers who paid to fund Vermont Dodd over periods of years, over a couple of administrations, it's not a a new thing of this administration over the past couple administrations, basically invested their dollars so that in the end, 60 percent of their registrations could be illegal. I don't think that's a good track record for the investment of United States citizens' tax dollars. Also, several of the witnesses are now out of the country, so we obviously can't talk to them, weren't able to talk to them. When we talk about pulling teeth, this whole process was pulling teeth without anesthetic. It was tough to get people to respond. Some people never did respond. So I think the task force did the best job that it could do. But the precedent we do set is that, in fact, we're not going to tolerate illegal voting. We're going to get down to the bottom of illegal voting. And we did that, I firmly believe, as meticulously as humanly possible. Now, there was talk previously in the task force of unsubstantiated charges and the one thing I point out before was that in the bottom line of this, we acted uh, correctly. We seated Congresswoman Sanchez, unlike the past, when a system was devised and crafted that was comfortable. We seated Congresswoman Sanchez. We then let the system work. And the system worked. As far as what Bob Dornan stated in the beginning, that there were illegal voters, Bob Dornan was correct. There were illegal voters. And I think this also leads to a series of questions we're going to have to answer as a Congress together, Democrat and Republican, for the best interests of fair and good and proper registration and having at least citizens vote in elections is, you know, what is the threshold of fraud we're going to tolerate? In this case, what's the threshold of illegal voters that were not properly registered that we're going to tolerate in elections? I don't know. We don't have a threshold coming into to this, and, I, and I, I understand we don't have one. But this also leads to the point that the precedent this sets is to make sure that we move to correct the election process because we can't tolerate illegal voting. 
We can't tolerate illegal voters. The citizens of this country deserve better. And this is not a phenomenon to California. It's not a phenomenon to Texas or to the West. So I think we conduct ourselves in the, in the uh, total proper manner. We did this going after one thing, not to put a particular candidate in a seat, but to get down to the bottom of allegations that ended up to be true, that there were illegal voters and there were too many illegal voters, and we need to find a way to make sure that that is held down to the barest minimum humanly possible in this country to make our voters have faith in the electoral process, because people don't have faith in the electoral process. When people across the country hear that, that over 700-some people were able to, to do this, I'm not saying it was there in intentional fault, but to the system allowed to be done, it, it stops the faith in the system. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Because I, I think it's important because we are talking to the American people. They're watching us on television. Uh, you understand, I'm sure, that 124 of those votes, of which the 725 that, that, that is on this list, were voters who were citizens and who were qualified voters but who technically had their absentee ballot delivered by the wrong person under California statute. Now, you can call them illegal voters, but they were citizens, proper voters of California, and had the proper person, as opposed to a neighbor or a friend, delivered the absentee ballot, they would have been uh, valid. And in fact, Roz Lever, the registrar, says that in normal instances, she would count those votes because she would have perceived it as a procedural deficiency, not a legal deficiency. So that, I mean, I think that's important to know when you mention the, the larger figure, that in fact, uh, a good portion of those we know are citizens of the United States and we know are valid voters. Uh, they did not deliver properly the ballot to the uh, uh, election polling place on the day of election. To uh, clarify the procedural deficiency of 124 people, they still shouldn't have voted, but I'll, I'll, lay, that, I'll lay that aside. They should, have, they should have delivered them properly. They were, they were proper voters. Okay. Well, they, they could vote that day. There was no problem with them voting. The problem was they had the ballot delivered by the wrong person because under California statute, it lists the proper people. Okay. I'm just pointing out that these procedure. were not bad voters. It was just they followed okay. incorrect procedure. We'll take the 124 out of the incorrect procedure but we'll talk about the 600 non-citizens, the 600 non-citizens in this case. And, and Mr. if you'll yield again, and I appreciate your, your kindness, I don't have the faintest idea as of this time who those 625 are. I want to thank the chairman who has said that we can certainly see those and make an analysis of that because, Mr. Day, I think you're absolutely correct. We ought not to have uh, illegal voters voting in, in, in elections. And we ought to make sure that doesn't happen to protect citizens' uh, right to vote and not have that vote diminished. I agree with you 100 percent. Gentleman's time has expired. Anyone else wish to uh, make a statement? Gentleman from Connecticut. Mr. Chairman, the um, resolution before us has uh, four lines that I can agree with. The resolution clause at the end that the election contest of Robert Dornan contestant against Loretta Sanchez contestee relating to the office of uh, representative from the 46th District of California is dismissed. The rest uh, is language to make um, the majority feel good about a witch hunt they went on. And uh, from the very beginning of this process, it was clear, I think, uh, that this was a vendetta about a previous battle. But when we looked at the facts in this case, there weren't the grounds to move forward. There certainly weren't the grounds to stretch this out for over a year's time and cost at least Mrs. Sanchez uh, in the neighborhood of excess of half a million dollars. Now, I think there generally is a belief in the majority party that there are masses of Hispanic citizens crumbing across the border, registering illegally to try to take over this country. I think it's a figment of their imagination. I don't know whether there was a lot of fraud, a little fraud. The only fraud I know about were the charges that were brought in California. And when you use fraud, you usually have to have some evidence, except for, of course, in Congress. Well, in California, when they moved forward with the, with the fraud allegations, the grand jury dismissed them. I heard about fraud for 12 months. If there was that much fraud out there, you think one of the Republican uh, officials would have found it. Now, when it comes down to using these numbers and this chart, what did INS tell you at the beginning of the process? 
They said the way we keep our records, for better or worse, you can't figure out, uh, you can't use it uh, to figure out who's a legal voter, who's not a legal voter. You complain the INS took too long to get you the information. They said your information won't work. Well, hallelujah, 14 months later, you guys have figured out the information doesn't work. You can't figure it out. Maybe we should. But that has nothing to do with this race, and we should have ended it. We've had a lack of cooperation from the minority. We haven't had an ad hoc process that I think has not distinguished the House. It's been more of an inquisition rolling along, making up the rules as we go forward. When you look at these people that we haven't figured out yet, you can't figure out who they voted for. I mean, they're not all Hispanics, ladies and gentlemen. Some of these people are Asians that tend to vote Repu Republican more. Of course, you're losing them along the way here, too. But I can tell you something. Hispanics in this country understand they've been under assault by the Republican Party. In police who stand there at election sites and try to dissuade Hispanics from voting, uh, and in this case and many others, it has taken us a long time to get here. The fact of the matter is, you don't have the evidence to take this seat even if you wanted to. And you, I think you did at the beginning, and I think you may have believed it. But it is clear she won. She won by a large margin. And now I think you owe her the decency to help pay those legal bills. We have forced, in what was a significant margin, we have forced this woman to go out and borrow in excess of a half a million dollars. We ought to pay those bills. It's not her fault this process ran amok. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll take, I'll take the motion back and offer it myself, if he's going to ask that. Anyone else wish to uh, make a statement? Mr. Boehner. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Let me begin by thanking uh, the members of our committee who served on the task force. Uh, the job that, uh, that, that they performed on behalf of this committee, on behalf of the House, uh, was a job that needed to be done, and I think they did it honorably. Uh, certainly, the job that they've had over the last 14 months has been a difficult one. Uh, we, as members of the House, have a serious responsibility under the Constitution uh, to determine uh, who was the rightful winner of an election. It is our responsibility to ensure that there are fair and honest elections uh, that, that... It's our responsibility to make sure that the, the members that were elected were elected in a fair in honest way. Uh, the investigation, uh, no one of this committee and no one in this House wanted this to take as long as it did. But I think every one of, every member of this committee understands uh, that as we went through the process, uh, that we had significant problems uh, with parties involved, other organizations that were involved in getting information in a timely fashion. Uh, the, the, you could even argue and I don't want to go way out on a limb, but you could even argue that some people drug their feet, uh, refusing to comply uh, with the subpoenas and the requests from this committee. Uh, but in the end, uh, I think we've had a, a good look at it. There certainly was fraud in the election. There certainly is a serious problem uh, with uh, non-citizens being allowed to register to vote and non-citizens actually voting. Uh, the determination of the task force is, is pretty clear. Not sufficient evidence uh, that, that the seat should be vacated. But we didn't make Ms. Sanchez sit on the sidelines during this 14 months. She was allowed to take her seat. Uh, I'm, I, I feel bad that every person involved in this, both uh, the, the contestee and the contestor, both had to put up sufficient, an awful lot of money for legal fees. It's unfortunate. But I think that what this whole process has shown to the House and to the American people is how serious we take our job. And the allegations that my good friend from Connecticut made, uh, Sam, are totally unfounded. Totally unfounded. Tell, tell me what part is unfounded. The, the accusations of the witch hunt, there was no witch hunt, and you know that. We, 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 have, we have a job to do under the, the Contested Elections Act, and we did it. I'd be happy to yield to the gentleman. I just say that there is a pattern that's developed in, in New Jersey and California where people in the Republican Party have gone after specifically new immigrants, particularly Hispanics. That pattern exists. It's got nothing to do with whether you and I are here. And I think that this was another in those actions that went after a minority group 
and that there wouldn't have been the rush to INS if this was a group without a Hispanic population. Reclaiming my time, this was about an election to the United States House of Representatives. It makes no difference to the members of this committee or the members of this House what the gender of the parties were involved, uh, what their ethnic background is. It's about an election. You'll recall in 19, after the 1994 election that we had several task force set up uh, to look at contests there. Now, just because under the old regime that we used to have here, uh, the, the Contested Election Act was never allowed uh, to, to run its course, there was never a serious look at who actually won the election or to deal with these objections, doesn't mean uh, that we should continue to turn a blind eye. I think we did uh, an honorable job on behalf of the House, and I'm glad that uh, this issue has come to a resolution, and I think it's time that we vote it out and take it to the floor. I yield back the balance of my time. Anyone else wish to be heard? Gentlewoman from Michigan. I, too, am happy that um, we are bringing this to a close after 14 months of tedious work and to commend the, the task force, uh, my colleague from Michigan, as well as Mr. Hoyer and Mr. Ney, for their work. Now, having said that, I, too, thought it was a witch hunt. As was mentioned by our member who served on the task force, a lot of the information we didn't get, we didn't get timely. Certainly, we have our staffs on it. They gave us and provided what they had available to us. What I'm very concerned about here is that we not disenfranchise the American voter where they don't vote, which is what we're experiencing across America with low voter turnout across America. Whenever we disenfranchise any group of people, America is not as strong as it ought to be. In California, there are 17 million registered voters. 10 million of them voted November 1996. 600, 10 million, 600, may have been illegal. We don't know who they voted for. We do know that 25% of them were registered Republicans. About 13% of them were registered independents. So we can't even use a figure that 600 voted illegally for Mrs. Sanchez, because as was mentioned in this meeting and the last, we don't know who they voted for. But I want to center on the money that we spent on this witch hunt. This committee's funds, half a million dollars. INS records, they, they think they spent between a half a million and a million dollars. Ms. Ch Sanchez legal bills, half a million dollars. Not to mention the pain and suffering, and I'm not an attorney, but if I were her attorney, I would think very, very hard about how we would handle this and whether she should be compensated. I support my two colleagues on this side when we say that Ms. Sanchez should be reimbursed after 14 months over $2 million spent between the parties, the pain and suffering. She needs to be reimbursed so she can get on. I'm amazed and very proud of her for being able to withstand the test as she continued to represent her people. But if out of 17 million registered voters in California, 10 million who voted in this election, we come down to 600 who may have voted or have been an illegal. I think the American citizens want us to do our job and certainly take this very seriously. And of course, we don't want fraud in elections. What we want is participation from Americans. What we want is a Congress that acts on those Americans' needs that include housing and education and health care and those kinds of things. As I've said on this committee, and I'm a new member, as you know, in this Congress, I can go anywhere in this Congress and be effective after serving here. This is a real test, and I'm, I'm happy, in a happy, friendly kind of way, that Chairman Gephardt, Mr. Gephardt, our leader put me here because it's really been a, a real educational experience for me. But I would hope now after nearly $2 million being spent, 600 votes out of 10 million registered voters might be questionable or illegally voted, that we not disenfranchise the American voter, that we energize them as we move to this election season in 1998, which is going to be a very important election across our country. We were sent here by over half a million people in our respective districts. We owe it to them to represent as they would have us to, and to go on with the business of the House and the business of this committee. So Mr. Chairman and, and to the task force, appreciate your time. Let's get serious about the American people's money, their tax dollars, who, who they send here and take care of the country, which I hope will be just as strong as we move to the new, to the new millennium. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer, for your leadership. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Anyone else wish to make a statement prior to the uh, chairman? Gentleman from Florida. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm the newest member of this panel. I came on about halfway through this um, investigation. And uh, uh, first of all, I want to commend the chairman uh, for the way he has handled uh, this investigation. Uh, first of all, this isn't about whether or not Ms. Sanchez uh, was seated. Uh, uh, she was, in fact, seated given all rights and privileges of uh, membership. Uh, and I take great exception to this being termed any kind of a witch hunt. This is a charge of voter fraud in a federal congressional election over which we have a very serious responsibility. And as I said uh, the last time I spoke on this issue, I serve on government reform and oversight. I guess the only member of this panel to serve on, on both uh, panels. In the last year, I said I've seen incredible instances of uh, abuse of campaign financing, primarily through foreign and illegal sources. And it's a, a grave concern to me that uh, we see this influence uh, in our elections process, and it properly needs to be investigated. We've seen this committee uh, and its task force uh, do an excellent job of, of looking at the question of voter fraud in this race. I might say that I have seen no evidence that uh, Ms. Sanchez has committed any voter fraud, but the fact remains and the facts today reveal that there was voter fraud by individuals who were not uh, citizens of the United States. I'm a little bit tired of having the other side uh, raised the question, whether it's Asians or Hispanic or uh, whatever individuals have some problem or group has some problem, uh, to come back and uh, charge our majority uh, with being anti this group or anti that group. I'm really fed up with that. I think that it's uh, uncalled for. You know, the American people have been through a lot. They've seen. Um, this whole process of campaign financing uh, and abuse uh, uh, just sort of swept under the table. Our investigations uh, demeaned. They're seeing uh, this investigation demeaned. And this isn't a third world country. What separates this country from other countries is that we go through these processes and that we, re we, we review what's taken place in our elections and uh, they uh, and, and all this sees the light of day, and that's what's taken place here. Uh, we've been shaken to our core just in the last uh, 10 days and what we've seen in, in uh, other uh, federal office. And now today we're going to close the door on this investigation. And you, you may or may not like uh, Mr. Dornan or his politics, but he and his opinion and folks who support him are also uh, uh, do their day in this process. And uh, they leave today, I, I believe, uh, having seen, and it's, there's great evidence I've seen here of lack of cooperation by federal agencies with our investigation, refusal of witnesses to testify. And most damaging uh, in my uh, concern is the disregard by the Department of Justice to enforce a request of the House of Representatives and to uphold the existing law that we passed. And all this raises to me uh, some very serious questions. However, again, I do want to say I didn't see any evidence of, of, um, of any misdeed by Ms. Sanchez, and she does uh, deserve to be seated, and uh, we do need to get to a resolution of this matter. I did see evidence, however, of gross voter fraud in a federal election. I did see evidence that federal agencies failed to cooperate in this investigation. And I did see a further eroding of the democratic process. And today's action may close the door on this investigation. But I hope, I really hope, that it opens the door to correcting the abuse and fraud that we found in the federal uh, congressional elections process. I really hope that for history and for the sake of this institution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, thank you. Uh, 
the gentleman and others have mentioned emphatically that clearly fraud was evident. What does the gentleman conclude from the fact that the district attorney uh, did not obtain any indictments of individuals or organizations from the grand jury of Orange County who reviewed this matter? Well, I've looked at uh, the work of the task force and what Mr. Uh, Ellers has, uh, has uh, determined, and I'm convinced that two-thirds of the votes that were cast in this election, and I don't know who they voted for, were fraudulent. And I, I really don't care who they voted for, quite frankly, or, or the outcome of the election. What I'm concerned about is the integrity of the process, and that's what's been questioned here, and that's what we're closing the door on. And I don't think that we finished the job, quite frankly. I think that there's been tremendous pressure, and to have the other side go down every day and to pressure this committee to end its investigation is a travesty of the process. And you can throw shoes at me or uh, whatever you like. Uh, that's my personal opinion. <laughs> if on, my uh, friend will frankly. yield, I do not want to throw shoes at him. Uh, you indicate that the evidence you've seen, I will, I will tell the gentleman that I have not seen the 628. I have no idea who they are. Uh, and therefore you have seen more than we have seen on this side. Again, the, the number isn't important. Uh, uh, if there, uh, well, in this case it is important because I think there's a, I said a gross uh, uh, number. That, I, 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 I retract that. I think it is important. I think that uh, this is a, uh, an election in which there was gross voter fraud and we have evidence of it and we're closing the investigation. now. It doesn't surpass the number. Maybe that's the magic number that we should reach is the number that uh, Ms. Sanchez won by. But that's not the question. And the question isn't Ms. Sanchez here. It's the integrity of the process. And that's what concerns me. And this question about the, the no, things that are thrown out here about the cost of the investigation. Point, this is minimal cost to preserve uh, the democratic institutions that uh, we should be upholding. Time Thank you. Expired. Prior to recognizing the uh, task force chairman, the gentleman from Michigan, I want to indicate that I have requested that he offer uh, a motion to uh, ask the um, contestants to submit attorney bills so that we can examine them and pay those that are appropriate. Uh, I will tell you that um, any attempted uh, payment of attorney fees which uh, focused on attempts of any one party to evade the Federal Election Act, uh, and although they have every right to go to court to contest its constitutionality, that certainly indicated that the timeline had to be uh, drawn out, and ultimately the courts, of course, as we knew they would, supported the constitutionality of the Act or any other actions uh, that were devised to stonewall, to delay, and to impede the committee uh, will be looked at very carefully in terms of compensation uh, by the committee for either uh, of the sides. Let me say also that numbers are important because elections are decided quantitatively uh, and that the secrecy of the ballot box is critical to free and democratic elections. The repeated desire to see the names uh, concerns me a bit because my fear in this process was that someone's name might leak out and that then those individuals would be focused on, become poster child uh, children for causes. And I am very pleased with everyone who participated in this process because, frankly, no names have leaked out. The person who really needs to see the names is the proper election official, the Orange County Registrar, who can then deal with the list to either determine that these people should remain on the rolls or be removed from the rolls. I just have to tell my uh, friend and colleague from Michigan that her emphasis on the 600 when comparing it to 17 million registered voters in California and 10 million who voted perhaps ignores the fact that the task force discovered up to 2,000 people who are on the rolls who did not participate in this election. It would reflect on the difference between the 17 million and the 10 million. But I also have to remind her, uh, as a Californian, that there are 52 congressional districts in California and that the number 600 that she reported is in fact then a number that has to be multiplied by the 52 districts in California, which means apparently folks are not concerned about hundreds of thousands of fraudulent voters. I 
think the American people think the people under assault right now are the people who play the game fairly and legally. Let me tell you, if you've been reading the newspapers, that California 46 isn't the only area that fraudulent voting activity is being carried out. Take a look at what has occurred in Miami, an underground jury investigation. San Francisco in California has been impacted as well. Texas, Louisiana, Maryland, Pennsylvania, uh, Alabama. I think the House Minority Leader's statement on November 6, 1997, is one that needs to be taken very seriously. He said, quote, we, the Democrats, are willing to try to engage in a general broad discussion with the Republicans of allegations that have been made that there was non-citizen voting in the 1996 election. Let's do it in a broader setting. Let's move it to an investigation generally about illegal voting of all kinds, and let's try and determine if there are problems around the country. One of the things that this particular investigation clearly indicated is that there are problems, at least in one area of the co uh, country. The grand jury investigation in Miami clearly indicates that apparently there are problems in that area uh, of the country as well. Let me address very briefly the comment about precedent. It's been mentioned by several other colleagues, but I want to put it in its proper context. Ms. Sanchez had a valid election certificate from the Chief Election Officer of California. The majority of this House honored that certificate and seated her. When the gentleman from Maryland's party was in the majority, there was a gentleman from Indiana who had a valid election certificate from the Chief Election Officer of Indiana, and his party denied that individual being seated. They then proceeded to examine ballots in that Indiana race, made up their own rules for counting them, and then didn't even count all the ballots by the rules they made up, which never applied to any election anywhere then or since. In fact, if you examine the way in which this procedure was handled by this majority, you can fault us for being overly cautious, for trying to be accurate and trying to be thorough. If the choice is between the way that election in Indiana was handled and the way we handled this one, give me the way we handled this one every time. It is without glee or rancor that it took us as long as it did to reach the conclusion that we have. We believe the conclusion we reached was the proper one. It just seems to me that at some point, someone would have cautioned someone that calling people racists because they're trying to get to the bottom of an election. And when, in fact, local election officials initiate the probe and utilize as the focus of the probe an organization working with people who want to become newly naturalized citizens, and an examination of the work product of that group shows that fully 60% of the people that they registered were registered illegally. It is not that we created that witch hunt. It is that those are the facts. And quite correctly, as the gentleman from Connecticut pointed out, a number of those individuals are, in fact, of uh, Asian uh, uh, nationality and who want to also be citizens of the United States. What that really means is that it isn't worth a whole lot at this point, I think, to try to point the finger at who was pursuing whom in which witch hunt but rather that the current laws of this country and of the states charged with carrying out a solemn responsibility, and that is determining who should appropriately vote in an election and making sure that that vote is not uh, diluted by people who should not be voting, simply are inadequate. And that we have to make changes as rapidly as we can because elections are occurring all the time in which people are being elected, and I believe on close elections uh, could very well be uh, being elected by a group of people who are, in fact, illegal. Uh, and so I am more than uh, happy to examine uh, the minority leader's opportunity to sit down and investigate uh, the illegal voting of all kinds and move forward to provide the tools to the election officers on the front line, both at the local and the state level, so that we can be assured that our roles are valid. Frankly, some laws that have been passed to do so whether intentionally or unintentionally. The fundamental question should be, are they diluted? I think there is no question that we have flawed voter rolls, and we need to move cooperatively uh, if we can. And if not, uh, we will move to make sure that
those roles are accurate. The gentleman from Michigan, the chairman of the task force, the long-suffering uh, gentleman from Michigan, recognized uh, for the purpose of offering a motion. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe uh, proper order would be to offer the motion after we adopt the resolution, but I do have some comments I would like to make. We can do it before or after. It doesn't make any difference. But you want some comments? Go ahead. I'll make the comments first and then offer it. And the reason for the comments, uh, just to take my five minutes, which I, I assume the report didn't count towards, uh, the, there are several statements that have been made here, in fact, quite a few, which simply cannot be allowed to stand without challenge. Uh, they are on the record. They have been uttered before the world. And as um, the gentleman from Maryland observed, they are being recorded on camera as well. He has said repeatedly in this meeting and also in the previous meeting that he has not seen these names. I have to challenge that, and I'm disturbed that he keeps repeating that. 124 of these are the absentee ballots, which we've been aware of from the beginning. 305 were submitted by the California Secretary of State to this task force in California, and those names have been seen. These boxes are filled with the records that our majority staff put together in an analyzing this election. The lids are on because we are under constrained under law to keep those names confidential. But the minority has been given many uh, have been given copies of many of the items contained in these boxes. Everything that we received from the INS, everything that went into the 7,841 suspect votes was passed on to the minority. Their staff has analyzed them. What they have not seen is the analysis, the method of analysis. We assume they use their method of analysis to come up with their number. But these are not secret files from the minority staff. Those who have signed the confidentiality agreements which they are required to do under law, have had access to the important information here, and it has been presented to them. I take particular umbrage at uh, reference to this as a witch hunt. And all I can say is the witches in Salem would have been delighted to have us as a panel judging their faith. They would have had a much longer lifespan than they did under the, uh, under the regime they operated under. I would also point out, as the chairman has done, if you look at the history of the minority party, current minority party, over the past two decades, and the way they've handled this, again, the candidates have been treated much more fairly by this task force. We have tried very, very hard to be fair, to be open, to be honest with the contestant and the contestee and their attorneys. No games were played. If they were, the resolution would be in the opposite sense, and we would and also, as a, a current majority party, not even have seated Ms. Sanchez in the first place. We did seat her. She had all the privileges of the office, has had them, continues to have them, and if we adopt this resolution, she will continue to have them till the end of her term of office. This was not a witch hunt. It was a careful, systematic, thoughtful effort to determine the facts. We have determined the facts, and we are moving that she retain her seat, that we dismiss the contest. Issues of fraud have been raised, questions of fraud. Where's the fraud? Show me the fraud. There it is, in those boxes. You can look at the registration cards of the people who registered and signed their name under a statement saying, I am a citizen of the United States of America. And they were not citizens at the time they signed those cards. If that is not fraud, I don't know what is fraud. Now, you can argue it wasn't intentional. This, they were misled by Amarandot or other organizations. But they did sign it, and that is fraud. Now, I don't care whether the Orange County Grand Jury wanted to indict or not. That has more to do with whether or not they could win a case in court or send someone to jail for it. The point is simply that those cards were fraudulently filled out, and there is absolutely no, no question about that, and I would be happy to have our counsel uh, comment on that if you don't believe me on that. Comment were made that you told us at the beginning the INS records wouldn't help. What you told us is that they were flawed. I find it amusing that the current administration continually dismisses incompetence as something that's acceptable. I can't believe it. The INS is saying, our records are flawed. You can't use them for your purposes. That's crazy. We used them, and we corrected them in many cases. We went through all the records and probably know more about them in, the, in these cases than they do. The problem is they have records that in one case show someone's a citizen. Other cases, they're not citizens. We had to resolve that problem. That takes time, and we had to dig through the records to find it out. Don't say that you told us at the beginning that we wouldn't find what we wanted. We found what we wanted. 748 votes cast by illegal citizens. Uh, pardon me, illegal votes cast by non-citizens of this nation. 
I think we have to recognize the INS records are flawed and we have to correct them and not simply say, well, we can't use them anymore. I know something about computers. It's no problem. You do it right and the records are good and you can use them. No, I will not yield. We've had enough said from that side already. <laughs> last point. The last point I want to make. consistent, at least, that sentiment. <laughs> last comment I wanted to make is on the issue of payment of fees. Uh, this came up at the last minute. It came up in the task force meeting. And I have not had time to look at precedents. I understand there are some precedents for doing this. And I would, um, I am willing to offer the motion as the, um, simply saying that I think we should look into this. Uh, we have to review the precedents. We have to review uh, what costs are submitted. And therefore, Mr. Chairman, I move that both contestants in the contested Mr. election. Would allow me, I would like to uh, uh, move the resolution favorably and then uh, a pick. Yeah, the, I'd prefer that too. Thank you. Uh, therefore, uh, the motion is on reporting a resolution favorably Mr. to the House. All those in Mr. favor? Chairman. Gentleman from Maryland. I I'd like to debate it. Uh, Mr. Ellers had two shots at the apple, and uh, I've had one, and I'd like to... I tell the gentleman that in his cross-questioning, he had about six bites of the apple. There has been a, a, a series of discussions. The task force met prior to this, and everyone was recognized for their time. Therefore, the motion is on reporting the resolution favorably to the House. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Uh, chair asks for a roll call vote. Mr. Nay? Aye. Mr. Boehner? Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ehlers? <laughs> <laughs> that was an aye and goodbye. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Ehlers votes aye. Ms. Granger? Aye. Mr. Micah? No. Mr. Gagenson? Aye. Mr. Hoyer? Aye. Ms. Kilpatrick? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Clerk will report the vote. Eight in the affirmative, one in the negative. There being eight ayes and one no, uh, the resolution will be favorably reported to the House. Uh, recognize a uh, gentleman from Michigan for purpose of offering a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that both contestants in the contested election in the 46th Congressional District of California be given the opportunity to submit reasonable attorney's fees and costs to the committee for review for, for consideration of possible payment from the applicable House account subject to review and approval of the chairman in consultation with the ranking minority member. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Maryland. Thank you. I have five minutes to discuss the motion. Is that uh, the committee rule? Uh, the chair has, as usual, been very reasonable with the light. If Thank anyone you. would notice, it's been read most of the time. Thank you. I appreciate it. How are uh, the gentleman calling my attention? He does have five minutes. I did not get an opportunity to respond to Mr. Ellers. Mr. Ellers again said there were 725 votes of illegal votes of non-citizens. His own records reflect that's not the case. It was more than a 15% overstatement of what his own records show. What is my point? My point is uh, that throughout the course of this case, we have been very loose with our allegations. We have said people were criminals on the floor of the House who were brought to the grand jury of their jurisdiction and were not indicted for any crime. It is very easy to say there are 800, there are 10,000, there are 50,000. And if you say it long enough, maybe it will be believed. In the boxes or out of the boxes, you cannot confirm your conclusion. I guarantee it. You cannot confirm it. You can believe it. You can say these records show it, but you cannot confirm it. Perhaps that's why uh, the prosecutor was a little more judicious. Yes, perhaps he was worried about whether or not he could show that this was the truth, as opposed to simply asserting it as truth. 
We began this investigation with somebody said something in the newspapers. And therefore, there must be something there, and we will proceed. Well, something is in the newspapers every day. And a lot of times, it ain't so. Now, what we are saying on this side is that, yes, we ought to stop fraud in elections. Yes, we ought not to have illegal voters vote. But we are also saying that we ought to have a judicious, fair, full, bipartisan, with the exchange of information on both sides, and look at these records together, as you would do if this were an election in the precinct where the election judge, who's the Democrat, and the election judge, who's a Republican, would look at the ballots and say, we agree or we don't agree, that they are valid or invalid. That was never done. Never done. To this day, it's not done. That's why I say to you, not that I haven't seen the 700, because I presume they're in the 500,000, which were originally sent to us from all over the country as names that possibly matched. That is why I say I have not seen, because until I know the names, and I appreciate the chairman observe, we have not disclosed a single name. But we do have a responsibility to know the facts, not the speculation, not as my friend from Florida asserts that he knows, with all due respect, I don't think he does know. He knows the assertion. He knows what you have said. He knows what's on this paper. But I submit to my friend, you don't know. You know what somebody has told you. It's called hearsay. You don't know. And I don't know. That concerns me. I do believe strongly that there are less than half the number of votes that you mentioned that are legitimately in question. And even those, I don't know until I confirm. And I have not been able to confirm. One thing, the boxes are very large and very impressive. But at the end of the day, the evidence that INS cannot give you, because they weren't designed to do this kind of work, is whether or not the John Smith in that box is the John Smith that actually voted, or is it some other John Smith that may or may not have proper identification? With the exception of Gaydens and almost every other name in this country, pops up tens of thousands of times, many of these names, and that's your problem. Some of these people have names in here who died in 91, and there's another one that exists with the exact same name that's alive and well today. There's no way to tell. And that's the problem with just throwing the numbers out there. Some of these people may be completely different. There may be two Sean Donahues. I know you can find them in Boston. I imagine you can find lots of people in this area with similar names. Yield back the balance I'm of my time, my gentlemen. Time. I want to say in closing that I think it is significant that the district attorney had this case under consideration for some 10 months, took it to the grand jury, and the grand jury failed to indict. That's not an insubstantial fact that we know. Clearly, the Republican uh, uh, district attorney of Orange County is concerned, as we are, with voter fraud. I presume the citizens who served on that grand jury are concerned about voter fraud. Unlike you, who are sure they saw the evidence and they weren't. I am glad that we're concluding this case as we are. I think it is appropriate. As I have said over and over again, it is never too late to do the right thing. I am hopeful that as we proceed in future cases, we will do so in a bipartisan fashion to construct a system, a process that will in fact reflect fairness to all parties so they have the ability to review the evidence and comment on the evidence, which they have not had the opportunity to do on either side. Gentlemen's I thank time. the chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. I don't want anyone. I don't want anyone to believe that the assertion of the gentleman from Connecticut was, in fact, the operating uh, procedure. Um, I'm a little tired of the same old arguments being made, and I will simply say this, because this is actually not on the question in front of us. When you have an Orange County registered voter and an INS file, in which the match is first name, last name, middle initial, 
date of birth, and exact same address. I think you will reach the conclusion, as we did, as the INS did, and as the Orange County Registrar will, that's the same person. It isn't this ephemeral argument that continues to be made. If, in fact, we were going to use those arguments as substantiation, the first week of the 105th Congress, Ms. Sanchez would not have been seated. What we did was go down and look at that level of detail and accuracy. And to argue otherwise is to say that we didn't do the kind of job that you should have done when you were the majority. Mr. The question Chairman, is on the motion of the gentleman from Michigan. Uh, parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, maybe I'm confused here, but is this the resolution that we just passed, Mr. Chairman? That's correct. And further inquiry, Mr. Chairman, I think the fourth whereas clause that eight members just voted for stated, and maybe I have a wrong copy, but it says, whereas despite the lack of full cooperation from witnesses and government agencies, the investigation of the election contest in the 46th Congressional District of California has resulted in evidence that over 700 illegal votes were cast in that election, including votes cast by persons who were not citizens of the United States. Is that what was passed and th that the, I didn't vote for it, but uh, that was passed and, uh, and maybe I have the wrong copy. Tell the gentleman you have the right copy, but as you know, the resolve well, clause thank, is Thank the you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate clause, your... Whereas is build the case and the case is very obvious. Uh, the question is on the motion of the gentleman from Michigan to request and examine the reasonable attorney's fees uh, for the contestants in the, um, the parties in the uh, California 46. Any, uh, and all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Uh, the ayes appear to have it, the ayes have it, and we will, um, Mr. Chairman, gentleman from we already have the uh, customary time uh, during which to file a minority dissenting and additional views. Cer certainly. Thank you. Uh, could we move to the regular agenda, or are we going to... Clarification on that. Clarification. What will that be, Mr. Chairman? The usual uh, time for minority views? It's 48 hours? Friday when? Friday midnight. Is that going to give you enough time? Uh, could, we, could we have Monday? Would, would, Monday would, be would, better with these guys. Let me double check. Monday I mean, I don't want to slow it down and go on the floor, obviously. <laughs> We'll do it Monday at 12 that, noon. Uh, if you, I was going to give you Monday close of business. Monday 12 noon sounds good. That uh, gives but us we'll, the weekend. Yeah, sure, right. Thank you can use the weekend. Thank you. Okay? Can we move now to the uh, regular agenda? Uh, those of you who were here only for this matter, would you leave quietly so the committee can conduct its other ongoing and important business? Hey, why can't I be nice like you? The first item that had been on uh, today's uh, uh, business agenda was the announcement of the um, interim activities uh, by the chairman uh, pursuant to the November 6, 1997 authorization, as is usually the case uh, on the uh, interim authority. Um, the first item in your um, packets uh, is the indication that we approved and provided notification of the members' representational allowances uh, for 1998, and that allowance reflected the increase uh, that was approved by the President for federal employees of 2.8 percent. Uh, that was uh, multiplied against the clerk hire component of the MRA and resulted in a 16,000 uh, plus uh, increase of the uh, basic clerk hire allotment. Uh, the second item was the approval of two reorganization actions requested by the Clerk of the House. Uh, the first was to reorganize the Office of Legislative Computer Systems, uh, was described by a letter dated uh, November 20th to the committee, uh, 1997, and uh, the second was a request to reorganize uh, according to the committee uh, prescription for, uh, in a letter dated January 2nd, 1998. The third was the approval of a request by the Chief Administrative Officer to release a request for uh, proposal for postal operations. As you know, Whitney Bowes uh, has said that they were uh, withdrawing and that we were going to have them with an increased contract and us having to do some of the work. So we requested uh, an extension with Pitney Bowes. We have it to create a window of opportunity for us to uh, see if uh, others would be uh, willing to work with us on the uh, postal operation requirements. 
Uh, and then the uh, final item was approval of a new mass mail obligation system uh, notifying uh, members by dear colleagues signed by both myself and the ranking member uh, to make sure that we are uh, assisting members to keep track of their accounts as we near the end of years so that they don't go over their allotted amount. Ge Chairman, gentleman from Connecticut. Mr. Chairman, um, in an attempt to expedite, mm -hmm. basically the only place that we have serious complaints at three and four, and, and I would say in two we just have a few questions, um, and I don't know if the okay. Chairman's choice is to move them all together once he explains them. Uh, have one on you have a question on one? Well, I yield to the lady when it's appropriate. Gentleman, gentlewoman from Michigan referring to the interim uh, actions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, some of the actions that were taken, and I, I, re I wrote you on January 24th, you, 21st, you responded on January 27th to my 21st communication mm -hmm. about some of the dismissals that were had in that interim period. Um, I've got quite a bit of uh, questions here, and as well as my chair, the ranking member on the subcommittee on um, employer-employee relations, and because some of those uh, people who are dismissed have raised several questions, I'd like to request a hearing uh, with those dismissed employees that they come before us so that we can clear the air. I'm hearing two different things. Um, Mr. Donald Payne, by the way, the subcommittee ranking member there, has raised several concerns to me. And rather than he said, she said, I would hope that we could have an open hearing with those dismissed employees. I do understand that we did vote on May 10th to uh, reduce that staffing from 69 to 43, that they further reduced it to 26 employees, and in that, five were dismissed during the interim period, and um, they, they believe that they've been unfairly uh, dismissed and that they had seniority. This is a bipartisan agency, and to clear the air, Mr. Chairman, I would request that we have a hearing on those dismissals, if possible. I understand the gentlewoman's concern. Um, I, I don't know, uh, and I think we should make sure that uh, all of the procedural due process uh, uh, is handled. Uh, I don't know that a hearing is the appropriate format, uh, and I'll ask either the CAO or the clerk or others who can assist me on the mechanics uh, of employment and concern over employment. We have an Office of Compliance. There is a procedure for um, appealing the kinds of decisions that are made uh, and a, a, a third-party analysis. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't sit down with folk and have them explain the circumstances in their own terms, but having set up a professional operation as opposed to the old patronage operation, the chairman is loath to jump back in, in in an attempt to utilize members' interaction in uh, decisions that uh, I believe in an employment structure should be dealt with uh, in those uh, remedy sources available in that employment structure. Now, having said that, does the CAO or anyone else want to assist me in the technicals of the way in which people who have uh, concerns about employment, work that concern through the system. And as you all rush to the uh, table, well, there are employees in your shop, uh, I would say to the clerk, but the chief administrative officer has under him uh, procedures for dealing with dismissed employees, job placement, uh, the, uh, the Office of Compliance is an avenue available to individuals. If someone believes that they were not treated fairly in an employment um, a circumstance, what are the options available to them now under the system? Actually, Mr. Chairman, it's not under the CAO. It would no, be... I know it's not under you. It's the right. Office of Compliance, right. which is separate. And that, and that would be the appropriate place if someone felt that there was uh, an improper action they would need to upload to uh, file a, a protest or an action claim with uh, the compliance office. That's not to say that we can't sit down and at least talk about it. I don't know that an official hearing of the committee, uh, which I think would be relatively precedent setting now, listening to cases, we would wind up as an appeals board. But I do want to try to meet the gentlewoman's concerns about making sure that decisions were made in a reasonable way. Sure, I, and I want to make sure of that too. And I might be a bit out of order and I will trust your opinion on this one. I was certainly uh, through Mr. Payne, who's asked for this, and the employees who've been through our office and your response to my letter, uh, will look forward into this. It may not be appropriate right now to have a hearing, so I would hold off and, and look, 
go the other avenue, but would certainly um, reserve my right to bring it back to you. And, and we may not even be the appropriate committee or sure. subcommittee to hold that hearing. Mr. Payne okay. uh, is in a position as a ranking member, and I might talk to the chairman of that uh, subcommittee. So if the gentlewoman would uh, accept my a uh, concern about making sure that uh, uh, everyone who was involved has a comfort level and due process is available to individuals to pursue their concerns. And, and the chair's not right, too, Mr. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thomas. Thank you. Any additional comments on the interim announcements? Then we'll move to the uh, second agenda item. And uh, the chair would lay uh, before the committee a request from the Committee on Education and the Workforce for an allocation from the Reserve Fund uh, and ask for its immediate consideration. Any discussion? You're on which number, sir? Uh, the number would be what I think was three and is now a number two. It is the Revised members request handbook. for, no, oh. uh, I thank the gentleman for uh, informing it. Uh, we thought we had all the I's uh, dotted and the T's crossed on the member's handbook. Apparently there are some concerns, questions. so we're just going to pull that off Fine. of the agenda Great. and I'll put it on at the next later. business Great. meeting. Uh, we thought we had reviewed it with everybody. Both members on both sides have, have some additional concerns. So I would then indicate that we're now moving to item number three, which was the Education and the Workforce Committee's request for allocation from the Reserve Fund. And just let me say that the uh, Speaker's Office has approved the committee's request. Uh, the approval letter is attached. The uh, appropriate uh, paperwork uh, has been done, the timeline uh, and the structuring as it is now required under the opportunity to utilize uh, funds from the Reserve Fund. Uh, and that is the item that is in front of uh, us now. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Connecticut. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have a general, obviously, objection to what's become a slush fund for uh, political battles that the majority wishes to engage in. It seems uh, that committees uh, in this Congress uh, get a budget, and then if you ask them to do any work, they need more money. So the first uh, tranche, which is significant to begin with, is just to be there. And if you actually have to do some work, you're going to go out and get more money and more lawyers. Some of these lawyers are making, uh, if they put in the hours they're supposed to, in the range of 300000 a year. Uh, it's a lot of taxpayer money. There's very little benefit that we've seen come out of these things. I guess my one question is, uh, we've had problem getting minority members uh, of, of hirees accepted, that we've... Not only do we get less money, and I commend the chairman for trying to make that better uh, in lots of places, but in the critical places where there's a political agenda, uh, or at least a partisan agenda, uh, then it seems we can't get the funding, we can't get the staff people approved, we have all kinds of problems. Now, in this area, what's the split? Do you know, does the chairman know what yes, the split? Yes, I would just tell the gentleman, I, I, I really am somewhat baffled by, by his comments in this particular request, it is a two-third, one-third split, um, allocation of all funds, something that the minority, when we were the minority, advocated and which we are following through and on where it is possible and makes sense. Now, obviously, uh, to try to do a dollar and cents uh, exact uh, uh, formulation, anywhere between 20 and 30 percent is twice as much as we used to get as the minority. What you clearly see here is $747,000. 247,000 of which is allocated to the minority to be spent as they see fit. That is a far different structure. Re reclaiming my Certainly. time. Certainly. I would just say that uh, during the uh, recess, we had problems with uh, approving uh, higher uh, individuals for employment on the minority side. Even though they had the resources, they weren't allowed to hire people. Uh, we think the, the use of the slush fund here is inappropriate. Uh, and. But we want to make sure that not only do they get the money, but then when they choose an employee or a contract, they're able to execute it. Uh, gentleman's point uh, is an important one, and I, I want to reinforce the argument that to the best of our ability, I do hope this committee continues to urge the chairman and the ranking members of the various policy committees to work out their differences among themselves rather than coming to us as a kind of uh, um, international court of justice at The Hague. Uh, to settle arguments that, frankly, should be settled uh, inside the committee. I can only indicate that based upon this particular request, it is clearly as fair as fair could be, both in terms of the staff uh, and the monies allocated. Mr. Chairman. Any additional? Uh, gentlemen from uh, Might I be recognized to speak on this uh, issue? First of all, 
Uh, I've heard the term slush fund for hopefully the last time. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen of the committee and those listening, what a slush fund is. During my first two years as a member of this uh, Congress, I turned back my money from my office operations, uh, thinking it was going back into uh, uh, some uh, treasury or uh, fund or reduction of the deficit very naively and found out, in fact, that those funds uh, ended up in what was called the Speaker's Slush Fund. And uh, that, in fact, is a slush fund. When we took over this Congress as a new majority, uh, we, in fact, cut the staff by uh, one-third, Congressional House staff by one-third. We cut the number of committees. We also cut the uh, funding uh, for those uh, uh, committees and for the House operations. Uh, I served on government reform and oversight. I remember going to the floor with a sign that said 5 to 55 and coming before, uh, I believe, this committee uh, when we had a budget. We had five investigative staffers to 55 on the majority side. Uh, today, we are, in fact, offering one-third. Uh, uh, so that's uh, what you call a slush fund and misappropriation and malappropriation of staff. So I think that uh, we're being uh, more than fair. This is not a slush fund. It is a fund that was passed by the entire House of Representatives and is administered openly and publicly by this committee where the resources are needed uh, to uh, supplement uh, uh, other uh, budgeted and approved items by this committee and by the Congress. So I just wanted to set this record straight. Sorry. Gentleman from Maryland wish to be recognized. Mr. Chairman, uh, I share Mr. Micah's sorrow <laughs> uh, at the straightening of the record. Uh, he doesn't want to hear slush fund again. Uh, I'm reluctant, therefore, to use the fact that this clearly is a slush fund, as Mr. Gadenson said on the floor and said here, in this sense. On the floor, when the, just, when the House voted on this, the justification was, oh, no, this would only be in extraordinary instances. As a matter of fact, the rule you adopted in the majority says that. Now, of course, we see how the committee uh, chairman is here justifying this request uh, and uh, telling us what he's already done with his $1.4 million. Uh, it's not here. So it may be done in the open, but we're told that the Speaker has already approved this. It's all done. It's wired, and you guys are going to vote for it. This is not a matter of discussion. And in fact, I have a letter here dated February 4th from Mr. Clay, the ranking member, that says, I write to oppose Chairman Goodling's request made at the behest of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee Chairman Peter Hoekstra for additional funding for that subcommittee's investigation into the 96 Teamsters presidential and to take strong exception to certain claims made by Chairman Hoekstra in his supporting documents. Now, I don't know that either Mr. Clay or Mr. Hoekstra were invited to this hearing today. Uh, this is perhaps not a hearing. We're just going to stamp it, approved. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, that the legal representation, has, uh, as I understand it, from the majority staff, I mean the minority staff, produced no timesheets, at least to the minority, to verify compliance with their contract. The committee has issued no subpoenas. We gave them $1.3 million before. They've issued no subpoenas since that time for hearings or documents and relatively few voluntary requests for documents. The committee has not finalized to this date, Mr. Chairman, as I understand it, according to the minority staff, a protocol for the handling and disposition of information and documents. Now, we've given them 1.3. They're coming back now for another three-quarters of a million dollars, and they haven't even issued a protocol for the handling of the initial funds. Now, uh, I understand what the gentleman is saying, that this is a considered way to handle uh, needs of emergencies. That's what your rule said. I don't see anything in the, in the justification saying this is an emergency. Uh, the committee has held only one hearing on this matter, Three others have been scheduled, but canceled. So of the four scheduled hearings, they've held one, 25 percent, yet they're coming back here for another three quarters of a million dollars. This is not justified. 
and it's certainly not justified by anything we've heard in this committee to date, and therefore, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to oppose this request. Mr. Clay opposes this request. The committee has not uh, shown a product from the initial uh, dollars that were given to it, and I don't think justifies at this time additional investment, and I would hope the committee would reject uh, this request for additional uh, slush funds. Uh, and I understand the gentleman's concern about trying to stay up with the movement of money between Teamsters and nonpartisan organizations that required the cancellation of an election and the disqualification of uh, the candidate uh, who won uh, and would say that that is not an emergency and no one should be concerned about it and we shouldn't investigate it. But uh, the gentleman's entitled to his opinion. Gentlewoman from Michigan wish to inquire. Not what you state my opinion is, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Thank you. I understand that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All those are very serious concerns you just re uh, reiterated. I'm not sure that's what, what Mr. Hoyer was saying. But I'm concerned about the first $1.4 million that committee got and what has happened over the past six months with it. Yes, we want to make sure that they have what they need. By our guidelines, we say that that slush fund can be used for two reasons, extraordinary circumstances. And if that is the case, then I want, show me how the 1.4 has been used and what you found. Have we got a report? Show us something. I think we owe that to the taxpayers who put out that 1.4 million. The other reason for going into the fund is unanticipated committee expenses. Maybe there were unanticipated expenses as they spent the 1.4. Show us that. Give us the report for that. We don't have the chairman nor the ranking member in the room to answer these questions. I'm a little disturbed that we're coming back now asking for three quarters of a million dollars to further an investigation, and we haven't got anything for the 1.4 yet. I was, as I read before and as we went, began this investigation and gave our committee, the subcommittee, Mr. Hoekstra is a Michigan colleague of mine, and I trust him that he will do a good job. We asked at that time and there was some discussion at that time in our caucus if, in fact, the people who had been retained, the firm who had been retained, um, were able to do this job and not be in a conflict situation, a conflict of interest. Has that been satisfied? Is that firm still hired? What documents, what reporting have they given us so that we can determine where they are? Maybe they meet the unanticipated committee expenses. Maybe they meet the extraordinary circumstances. But we don't have that information before us. Um, some information has come to me that that firm who does the investigation may not be spending enough hours on it anyway. Uh, but I won't go to that because that could be subjective. I want to see objective information and data. If, in fact, the 1.4 was spent and they need more because of the two guidelines that we've set in our guidelines as extraordinary circumstances or unanticipated committee expenses, then perhaps we'd have some information, objective information before us. Perhaps they do need the new three quarters of a million dollars for this uh, investigation. Certainly this side of the aisle wants all just and fair and impartial objective materials before us as we come out and again take money out of this extra fund, also known as the slush fund. So Mr. Chairman, I can't vote for this. I'd like to hear from the chairman and the ranking member has sent to us in writing. Uh, we don't have any document to know when they worked the people have been retained. So I think it's ill-advised, certainly this soon. I would, make and re would like to reconsider it if we had either the chairman or the ranking member, if we had a report or some, something showing us how the uh, initial 1.4 was, uh, was spent. So I would hope we wouldn't continue these. This is a six-month-old investigation, 1.4 million. Where are we going with this? And when will they be back for more? Don't we want to see the documents? Anyone? Uh Anyone wish to make additional comments? If not, I recognize the gentlewoman from Texas. Mr. For Chairman, I move, I move that the request be approved. The gentlewoman from Texas has moved that the request for the Education Workforce Committee's request for allocation of the Reserve Fund be approved. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. But opinion, we can count. In, in the opinion, <laughs> Chair, the ayes have it, and uh, the request uh, is approved. Motion to recommit laid upon the table. The next uh, agenda item is an additional reserve uh, fund request uh, for a government and workforce committee's uh, request for a census subcommittee. 
just let me indicate that in the past there had been a standing, as a matter of fact, historically, committee on the census uh, from 1901 until the Congressional Reorganization Act of 1946. From 47 to 58, there had been a census oversight structure in the old Post Office and Civil Service Committee. We have restructured that, but from 59 to 94, there was a subcommittee on the census. Uh, it's pretty obvious that at uh, certain times, uh, such as now, it's appropriate to have a subcommittee focusing on the census. Probably doesn't make a lot of sense to fund people over the entire decade uh, to oversee uh, the census. Uh, this is, I think, in uh, my estimation, uh, a, a, an entirely appropriate use of the reserve fund because uh, following the end of the 105th Congress without uh, an additional request and rep approval, this money will not remain in the committee's fund to allow them to expand, which was the primary way uh, committees continued to increase their budgets and frankly get uh, grossly out of hand in the old structure. Uh, anyone wish to discuss this motion? Mr. Chairman, briefly. Gentleman from Connecticut. I uh, know that Mr. Lender must be um, very unhappy that he was not able to fill the commitment uh, because in the resolution that passed the House, further is my hope that the expenses needed to establish this temporary new subcommittee uh, will, to the extent possible, key word, be derived from existing resources of the Committee of Government Reform and Oversight. Mr. Chairman, uh, what, do you know what the split is on this committee between majority and minority? On the committee or on the subcommittee? On this, uh, this new funding, how is that going to be split? My understanding is there are 15 temporary staff uh, positions, 11 for the majority and four for the minority. And the minority is further capped uh, their salaries and gets about a quarter of the money. I believe the quarter and of the money is And this is a committee that we've had particular trouble with and we will oppose uh, this proposal. As you did on the 33 percent, and I understand that. Any additional comments? I recognize the gentleman from... Maryland. Sure. Mr. Chairman, I didn't sound too happy about that, but I appreciate it. No, no, I was going it. from Ohio to I, Maryland. I got you. Mr. Chairman, uh, again, Mr. Linder indicated these would be, this, these expenses would be out of the committee uh, uh, funds. Uh, uh, gentleman Clint, Yield, I believe the statement that the gentleman from Connecticut said was not an absolute statement as the gentleman from Maryland just hopeful. stated. That it was, that we would do our best to to get them out of those funds, which is a qualified statement, not an absolute one. A qualified uh, representation on the floor of the House uh, was made that these uh, uh, would be derived from the existing resource of the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight. Now we're asking for 1.5 million. The Ethics Committee, or so-called Committee on Standards... 1.1, 1. 1, rather than 1.15. 1. 1. 1. Yeah, yeah, not 1.5. Correct. Uh, the. Committee on Standards of Official Conduct for 1998, its entire years of operation, gets $1.2 million. Uh, the entire budget for the Rules Committee is $2.3 million. For all the veterans, 2.2. And the Select Committee on Intelligence, 2.4. Uh, this seems like uh, an extraordinarily large figure uh, for a uh, subcommittee that I'll bet uh, in, uh, you, you indicated it existed, a subcommittee existed uh, before. Uh, didn't spend 20% uh, uh, of this money in the operations of the subcommittee in the years past. Prior to the time you created uh, uh, this new committee, did away with the Post Office Civil Service Committee and said you were going to therefore affect savings. I understood that, but obviously what you have now concluded is that you couldn't affect those savings and are going to spend the, uh, uh, the money on an ad hoc basis rather than an uh, uh, appropriated basis where the committee would come in and justify ex its expenses. Once again, we don't have the committee before, the, uh, uh, the officers of this committee before us to justify how they're going to spend this $1.15 million, $1 million, which is a substantial difference than we do when we have regular appropriations. This is, if, if this is a new subcommittee, I I'm not sure why they don't like you would if you were a committee chair. Uh, Chairman of Ways and Means Committee comes in here and justifies in a hearing. You ask questions, we ask questions, and they justify their expenditures. Here, we don't have that uh, opportunity. I would hope that we would not approve this. Uh, and I would indicate to the gentleman that he knows, of course, that uh, when the standing committees make a request, it's for the entire Congress. It's an ongoing structure with permanent employees. Uh, this request is simply for the remainder of the 105th Congress. 
uh, it then will cease unless it's reauthorized. The gentleman also well knows that the Committee on Standards of Official Conduct gets whatever money it asks for. Uh, there are times when there are no cases in front of it and they make a modest request. There are times when there are cases in front of it and every request the Committee on Standards of Official Conduct makes uh, this committee has always honored so that they can do their job. The other standing committees made their requests and we provided them the funds that they asked for. Again, they have permanent ongoing staff which allows them to deal with the problems that they face as committees um, based upon the request of the committee, uh, of the committee chairman uh, in front of this committee. And additional comments? Just unanimous consent to sure. include uh, both Mr. Waxman's letter and Mr. Clay's letter, the ranking members of the Without objection, the uh, letters from the gentleman indicated will be included uh, in the record. You, uh, recognize the gentleman uh, from Ohio, Mr. Ney, for purpose of offering a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that the request be approved. Uh, the vote is on the request for the Government Reform and Oversight Committee's request for an allocation from the Reserve Fund for the Census Subcommittee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Opinion Chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, the motion is agreed to, and the motion to recommit is laid on the table. Mr. Chairman, I have a unanimous request, uh, consent request. Uh, uh, immediately after following the statement of Mr. Clay, I have a rebuttal to his comments, which I'd ask unanimous consent rather than take the time of the committee to elaborate to uh, be made part of the record. Without objection? The gentleman's request uh, uh, is honored. Uh, the next item is the Inspector General's 1998 audit plan and perpetual inventory of proposed audits. I see the gentleman moving uh, to the table. Uh, and in the back of your book, uh, which once again is a kind of an unprecedented thing uh, that was initiated by the new majority, uh, but what it does is lay out in uh, an objective uh, and a public way the program of the Inspector uh, General for carrying out uh, routine audits uh, of the House and the related support structures, uh, including a uh, very useful uh, timeline uh, to indicate when those uh, various projects uh, would be initiated uh, and hopefully concluded. Uh, any questions on the uh, audit request from the Inspector General? Gentleman from Michigan. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll try to be brief because I, I realize the hour is getting late, but I think several questions have to be raised. Uh, one, a couple that I raised last time around. The, uh, at the time that the, the uh, Republicans took over the majority of the House, they were engaged in extensive audit simply because no comprehensive outside audit had been done for some uh, 40 or more years. Uh, that was done. We are busy cleaning up the system, the financial systems of the House. Uh, at some point, it seems to me, we're going to need fewer auditors than we've had the first three years. And I asked uh, Mr. Lanehart last year if we were at the point where we could begin to reduce the number of audits and auditors, and since we're in a, a stationary operating mode now rather than a cleaning of the house operating mode, his response at that time was we're not quite there yet. So the same question again, are we at the point now where we can start saying, look, we've, we've got everything organized, it's stable, uh, now we're just doing routine annual audits rather than uh, cleaning the house audits. Uh, where are we at that point and when can we expect you to come in here and say I've really got too many staff members and I really don't need as many contract uh, allocations as I've had and we can start saving some money here? Well, in my uh, proposed annual audit plan and in my testimony before the Appropriations uh, Subcommittee, I indicate that our audit inventory has leveled off with this year. Uh, but there's still twice as many audits in our perpetual inventory as are included in our annual plan and twice as many audits that need to be done as we have staff and dollars to perform them now. Uh, however, uh, I think it's good that the inventory is leveled off. We have seen the uh, stabilization, if you will, in the House uh, that has occurred, but I think we're at the optimum level right now. Actually, I probably would argue for a little bit more, but I'm not going to do that. Um, until we get a clean opinion on the financial statement audit of the House, until we 
resolve over 300 outstanding recommendations uh, that still need to be corrected, I can't see any way to re reduce our resources at this time. Furthermore, and really even more importantly, the Office of the Inspector General adds value to the administration and financial activities of the House. And that's our philosophy. We don't try to go out and do the gotchas. Um, we try to provide management advisory services to help improve House operations. And you're right, things have progressed tremendously since our first ever House audit. But I'd mention that we, we were the ones that identified that the House had a year 2000 problem. It had been ignored uh, and now is being addressed as a result of our uh, initial audits. Um, that's one that was a gotcha, if you will. But in addition to that, since 1995, we've been working with the Chief Administrative Officer in the implementation of the FFS system. And I think he would attest to the fact that our, our involvement's been instrumental in that effort. We're now working in the Human Resources payroll system, trying to help determine the requirements and then help in the implementation of a new Human Resources payroll system that I think is critical. The same thing's true of the fixed asset system. And at the request of this committee and the Appropriations Committee, we added to our annual plan last year an audit of the mainframe migration options that this committee directed uh, in November of 95 HIR to perform and didn't perform. So I think our resources, if you will, even though they're different than they were in the beginning, and actually about half of the original budget in the, the original House audit, um, I think we're at an optimum level right now. I think uh, we need to continue with that level for the foreseeable future. I noticed uh, in this audit plan you appear to have fewer audits directed at HIR uh, relative to the other areas of the House than you did the last time around. Does that indicate that HIR is, is in better shape than it has been in the past and that uh, the recommendations that you've given have been followed? As, as you see, as the next item on the agenda, approving the security policy, there have been a number of improvements in HIR, uh, foremost of which is the new director or his associate administrator, Tim Campen, um, and his um, the philosophy, if you will, of how to manage HIR is quite an improvement. What we did for the HIR plan was try to back off and let him take the actions that are needed in the management area and we concentrated in the security area because we figured we could help the most, and, and this is agreed to by the Chief Administrative Officer, that we could help the most looking at security, concentrating our efforts in that area. And final question, uh, how are we coming on the entire financial management system for the House? The uh, financial management system, when it was implemented, there were 10 tasks that still need to be completed to really stabilize the system and complete the project, if you will. Uh, unfortunately, we're still working on six of those ten activities, but again, with the new team, with the CAO and the finance officer, uh, I think we've got a good shot at completing those by the end of the summer. Um, that will stabilize the existing system. Um, it, for example, they've reduced, they've reduced the number of vendors that were listed in the file that caused erroneous payments, duplicate payments, by about 50 percent just in the last couple of months. So they're making major strides. In addition, the Chief Administrative Officer has proposed to the FFS Steering Committee that we look at the, the ultimate solution, if you will, for a, a permanent solution for a new uh, financial management system that would get at some of the issues that you've raised in the past of putting uh, on the members' desks accurate, timely information of their expenses, that we're very encouraged by that and working again with the ch Chief Administrative Officer towards that end. All right. And let me clarify, not just on my desk, but on my computer desktop. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Since I can access my personal bank account over the telephone and find out instantaneously what my balance is, I think it's entirely uh, appropriate that members of Congress be able to look in their computer and find out the balance in their, off uh, their MRA. Uh, at any time. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? I want to review those numbers because obviously if you don't have helping hands, 
to carry out the various audits to make sure that uh, the books are accurate and that decisions are being made in a timely fashion, it's difficult to do it. How many employees do you have now in the 105th Congress? We have 21. You have 21. How many did you have in the 104th Congress? Uh, we had uh, 19. And how many did you have in the 103rd Congress? Three. 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 Um, chair, chair recognizes gentleman from Ohio for the purpose of offering a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, chairman made Prior a to offering the motion, the gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Thank you. The chairman made a good point. Uh, when we were in charge, we didn't do uh, the audit job properly, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, we had too few people doing it. We were moving in the right direction in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, so I think that the, uh, I want to make it clear, I think the audit function is a critical one. Mr. Lanehart, I think you are doing an excellent job. Uh, and I think we are moving in the right direction. I think this timeline and setting forth what we're looking at, when we're going to look at it, and the time it will take is an excellent uh, uh, step. And I think this will, uh, and I think you do your job in an absolutely nonpartisan uh, way, not bipartisan, nonpartisan, as we would hope it to be. This institution needs to run honestly, uh, efficiently, uh, and in a timely manner. Uh, as it relates to its ministerial functions as opposed to its policy functions, which are subject to the vagaries of a democracy, which are messy and uh, mixed up and uh, sometimes lengthy. But there is no excuse. Uh, we were properly criticized, and in my opinion, we did not do the job we should have done. Uh, and uh, I think the reforms in this respect are good. And uh, when we're in the majority next Congress, I'm going to urge that we keep them. Thank the gentleman for his <laughs> comments. Uh, right up till the end. <laughs> no, no. And uh, the, the gentleman's response was perhaps triggered by my comment, but, but really what I was trying to indicate was that you can create an IG position, and if you don't staff it, they can't do the job. And that although we clearly have increased from uh, 18 to 21 in the last two Congresses, uh, I am willing, at least for the time being, to allow the Inspector General to settle into a number that he believes appropriate uh, to go forward with it. Clearly, three is not enough. Uh, 21's getting there, uh, and we'll see uh, uh, over the next, uh, the second session of uh, the 105th and the beginning of the 106th when we oversee the plan that you offer to the Republican majority uh, if, in fact, the numbers that you have are appropriate. I would recognize that. about to associate my, uh, <laughs> want, want my uh, words to be associated with the words and comments of the distinguished gentleman from uh, Maryland. Uh, he uh, got into so much self-flagellation, uh, I was about to uh, agree with him, but then he got into meddling when it came to the next, <laughs> about uh, changing the control of Congress. So I just have to remain silent <laughs> on the record. Thank you. <laughs> knew that it couldn't get 100 percent. Came close, came close. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the staff observes, and I think it, it's proper just so we, uh, because of the bipartisan conversation, uh, one of the reasons it was as th at three, as you know, there was a startup office, uh, and that was in a bipartisan uh, uh, effort, uh, urged by uh, the, the minority then and adopted by the majority, but you are correct, three clearly was insufficient, and, and I think we're moving in the right direction. And I agree with you. I don't know whether 21 is the right number. Mr. Lanehart, I, I have full faith and confidence in his uh, judgment uh, as to how, how many people he needs to do the correct job so we know what, what's going on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. process is sometimes painful but absolutely necessary. Uh, gentleman from Ohio, if there are no further comments. Mr. Chairman, I move that the audit plan be approved. Uh, the vote is on the motion to approve the Inspector General's audit plan. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Gentlewoman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had been inadvertently did not ask unanimous consent to have Mr. Payne's letter, as the other two ranking members have been Certainly. inserted as a part of the record. Uh, the letter from uh, Mr. Payne or Thank any you. other extraneous material that any uh, member wishes Extraneous. to insert at the appropriate place in the record. 
Uh, and the last uh, agenda item uh, is a resolution offered by the Chief Administrative Officer uh, dealing with information security uh, guidelines. Uh, does any member have any comments? Gentleman from Michigan have any comments on the security guidelines? Uh, just, just a quick comment, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I continue to be concerned, and I think uh, it's important to make this comment just to publicize it. I think the major security uh, danger that we face in our computer system is still that some members insist on having their own modem in their own office, and that's uh, the easiest way for a hacker to break in rather than using the callback modem system that HIR has installed. And I think the, I, I realize uh, they like to hang on to it and it's difficult to remove it, but I think we have to, over the long term, move into the direction of removing that. Thank you. The gentleman makes an observation which the chair will only indicate that uh, as we move rapidly into a fundamentally different way of communicating over the internet, the web, and members have unprecedented flexibility in utilizing computers uh, with electronic extensions, that we will continue to do as best a, a job as we possibly can in providing flexibility and usability to members. But the bottom line has to be that this money is taxpayer money. It has to be used for the furtherance of their legislative duties uh, and that an argument of a desire to emulate the private sector or what they may have purchased with private dollars is simply a comparison that cannot be made. However, within those constraints, we rain, remain committed to provide members with the ability to meet their uh, elected responsibilities as easily and conveniently as possible. And frankly, I think we've made giant strides over the last several years, but clearly we need to do more. Any additional comments? Gentleman from Maryland. Uh, gentleman from Ohio, have a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that the resolution be approved. Uh, the vote is on the uh, adoption of the resolution on information security guidelines. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, there being uh, no no's, the ayes have it. Uh, the resolution uh, is agreed to, and uh, the chair would uh, ask the gentleman from Ohio to say the magic words. You know, I, Mr. Chairman, I move that the uh, staff be allowed to, uh, or I move for unanimous consent, staff be allowed to make technical corrections and conforming corrections to the uh, Without objection, uh, that will be done, and uh, no further business. Gentleman from Maryland. Just a question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I had talked to Mr. Ellers earlier. Uh, on, in terms of the Sanchez resolution, uh, are we planning on bringing that to the floor next week? Chair's understanding is that the resolution uh, is planning to be brought to the floor uh, next week. My understanding is that legislative days week, will be only Wednesday and Thursday, yeah. and my assumption is it will be done, but I, I'll, I'll get a confirmation and get back to the gentleman. Thank you. Uh, my assumption is operate that it will be until we know otherwise. Uh, no further business coming before the committee. The committee stands adjourned.
Following the House Contested Election Task Force meeting, House Minority Leader Richard Gephardt, California Representative Loretta